The Buckwheat by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Buckwheat. Often in passing by a field of buckwheat after a thunderstorm, we see it all look quite black and drooping. We might almost think a flame of fire had swept over it, and it is then that the farmer is used to say, Ah, the lightning has done all that to it. But why has the lightning done all this? will be asked, perhaps by some solitary traveller, who seeks a natural cause, or at least a simple reason, for all that nature does. I will now tell you what the house sparrow told me about it. The house sparrow had it from an old willow tree that once stood, and indeed is now standing, close by just such a field of buckwheat. It is a large, grave willow tree, gnarled and rich in years, that seems to have burst in the middle, and from whose gaping clefts grow the grass and the bramble, and seem quite at home there. Its trunk bends over very much, as if it wanted a prop, and its branches hang down to the ground, like long green hair. On all the fields round about grew beautiful grain, rye and barley and oats, yes, the pretty oats, which, when they are quite ripe, look just like a flight of little canary birds on a bough. The growth of the corn had been blessed, and the heavier it was, the more humbly the good plant bowed its lowly head. But there was a field of buckwheat, too, and this field stretched itself out on one side till it reached the old willow tree. The buckwheat did not bow its head at all, like the other sorts of corn but towered up in the air as proudly and stiffly as it could. I am as rich as the greatest of them, it said, and much prettier too. My flowers are as beautiful as the rosy apple blossom, and the delightful treat it is to look at me and my companions. Do you know of anything more beautiful, more noble, or in short, anything that can vie with us, you old dreamy willow tree? And the mouldering stem nodded its mossy head as if to say, Oh, yes, indeed, that I do. But the buckwheat tossed up its head in pure disdain and said, The foolish tree, he is so old that grass and weeds are creeping out of his body. In the meanwhile, a very heavy storm came on. All the flowers of the field folded their leaves together or modestly bowed their tender little heads to the ground, whilst the wind whistled over them. The buckwheat was the only one that stood saucily erect in its pride. Bend down as we do, whispered the other kind flowers. What need have I to do that? said the buckwheat, who would not easily be taught. Bend down as we do, cried the corn. The angel of the storm is coming. He has wings that reach from the highest cloud to the bottom of the lowliest vale, and he will dash you down before you can ask him to have pity on you. Once for all, I will not make so little of myself, answered the buckwheat shut up your flowers and draw in your leaves said the cautious old willow tree look not up at the lightning when the cloud opens even men dare not do so for when it lightens they can see quite through into heaven though the light strikes them blind what then would not befall us the herbs of the field if we in our littleness dare to do so in our littleness echoed the buckwheat mockingly no indeed I will look straight through into heaven. And he did so in his guilty pride. It lightened so brightly that the whole world seemed to be in flames. As soon as the storm had raged its last, the flowers and the corn were seen standing in the still pure air, refreshed with the rain and happy as the spring. But the buckwheat, the poor buckwheat, had been burned as black as a coal in the lightning. It was nothing more now than a dead, useless wheat of the field. And the old willow tree waved its branches in the wind, and large drops of water fell from the green leaves, as if the tree were weeping. And the sparrow said, Why do you weep? It is so beautiful here. Look how the sun is shining, and the clouds sailing along. Do not you breathe the sweet scent of the flowers and the bushes? Why do you weep, then, you old willow tree? and the willow tree told of the pride and the haughtiness of the buckwheat and of the punishment which sooner or later always follows upon crime i who now tell this story over again had it from the chattering sparrows they twittered it to me one evening 
when I asked them for some pretty tale. End of the Buckwheat by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Sonja Cats and Dogs Author Unknown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by E.J. Wiley Cats and Dogs Such a snowy day as it was, Rob stood at the window with a frown on his forehead, for was not this the day on which he and Will and Jack and Ned were to go after school to Long Lake skating? it was only the day before this that the ice had been pronounced strong enough to be safe and here it was snowing as if it never meant to stop it was too bad to be sure rob had been able to skate nearly every day for a fortnight but that was only on the meadow brook a mere puddle he said in comparison with long lake where one could go three miles without a curve where they could find plenty of dead wood about the shores to build fires with but there seemed to be no help for it. The snow came down thicker than ever. It must have commenced soon after dark the night before, for it was now more than a foot deep. Well, there is one comfort anyway, thought Master Rob, as he turned from the window. I can't go to school, and so I shall have a holiday. What shall I do? Shall I work with my tools, or shall I go out to the barn and see the dogs? I think I will go and see the dogs. Rob was a great dog lover, and there was not a dog anywhere about that did not love him. Every friendless cur came to him at once and found a place in his heart. His father used to say that if he could have had his way, he would have more dogs on the farm than all kinds of cattle put together. As it was, he had a good many. First and foremost was Fleet, a great shaggy Scotch deerhound whom he had found sitting thin and unhappy outside the door one stormy winter's day. He was a very different-looking dog now. His bones were all covered, and his unhappy days were over. Whenever Rob mounted his pony for a gallop, Fleet was ready to go with him, and many and many was the mile that they had raced along together. But Fleet was the first of many, and they were all in the barn where the Rob was now going. I wonder where Grace is, he said. Perhaps she'd like to go, too. He found Grace down on the floor in front of the kitchen fire and extended to her the invitation to go with him. She was watching her cat drink a saucer of milk and did not appear very enthusiastic at the idea. I've seen the dog so many times, Rob, dear, she said, and it is so very stormy that if you don't mind, I think I won't go. All right, said Rob. The snow is pretty deep, and the paths are only partly made. Would you mind taking Pussy with you? asked Grace. I think she would like to catch a mouse for her breakfast. Not a bit, said Rob. So Pussy was put on his shoulder, and he set out. She seemed to be quite used to being carried in this way, and to find it much better than dragging through the snow, for she balanced herself very nicely as he plunged along through the drifts. He was yet some distance away from the barn when his friends within knew that he was coming, and a chorus of barks and whines arose. And when he opened the door, he was the center of a jumping and whining pack. There were only two old dogs besides Fleet, but there were puppies without number. Jip, a Scotch collie, had six. They were not yet able to leap up and take care of themselves generally, so that in the hurly-burly that took place when Rob came in, they were stepped on a good deal, and there were several loud squeals of pain from them. At this, their mother suddenly stopped fawning upon her master and seizing them one at a time in her mouth, deposited them with a little shake in their box, as much as to say, Stay at home, you small puppies. You are much too little to be out by yourselves. Then she settled herself in their midst, beating her tail with great violence on the floor whenever Rob looked her way. When Jip went back to her box, the floor seemed quite clear. Two half-grown pups, however, still tumbled over and over one another at his feet. 
Rob did not waste any time over them, but taking down a stone mug that hung on a nail, he walked around to where the cows stood in their stalls, went to one, and commenced to milk his mug full. Pussy, meantime, jumped off his shoulder onto the cow's back and stood there purring while he milked, apparently regarding the whole proceeding with great satisfaction. The cow did not seem to mind having such a strange rider. No doubt Pussy had been there before. When Rob had filled the mug, he held it up, and the cat took a dainty sip or two. But the milk she had drunk in the kitchen seemed to have been all that she wanted. So she soon stopped. Just at that moment, she caught sight of a rat that was boldly smelling about in a distant corner, and giving a flying leap, was after him like a dart. But Master Rat had seen his danger, and the last of his tail disappeared through a crack in the floor, just as Puss arrived at the spot. "'That was a pretty close shave for you, old rat,' said Rob, and he picked up the mug, which he had laid down to watch the performance, and going around where he had left the two pups, poured some of the milk into a saucer for them. Then he went on to see the last litter of all. The mother was a little Scotch terrier, and her three little puppies were coiled up in a basket of straw beside her. She had not rushed with the others to greet Rob when he first came in, for she had never had puppies before and did not care to leave them for a single minute. She had whined and barked and wagged her little tail with all her might, but leave her puppies she could not. Rob went over to her and took up one of the little fellows in his arms. Saucy, for that was the terrier's name, looked on very anxiously. She did not know what might be going to befall one of her precious children. By and by, Rob grew tired of the dogs, so then he strolled over to where John, the hired man, was busy at the hay-cutter. John was not in a pleasant mood this morning, and so Rob, finding the barn grow a little tedious, decided to go back to the house. The snow was still coming down as fast as ever, so he went to the kitchen door and stamped and shook himself clear. Then he opened the door and went in. A bright fire was filling the whole chimney place with its red glow. He stopped in front of it for a minute to get warm. Then, turning to the old housekeeper, who sat on one side of it, he asked if she knew where Grace was. I think she's in the library, said the housekeeper. So Rob went on to the library, and there he found Grace reading. Let's have some kind of a game, he suggested. Grace was in the midst of a most delightful fairy tale. Wait until I finish this, Rob, dear, she said. It is only forty pages. Forty pages, said Rob. Why, it will take you an hour. He went out of the room, and I'm afraid banged the door just a little behind him. I'll find Mama, he thought. Mama was easily found. She was sitting in a great high-backed chair in front of the fire with her lap full of stockings, whose holes she was darning. Rob pushed them all out of her lap onto the floor and climbed up in their place. Do tell me a story or something, Mama, he said. What shall it be about? asked his Mama. Dogs, I think, said Rob, after considering a little. Did you know, said his mamma, that dogs were sometimes used instead of horses? Away to the north, where the snow lies deep nearly all year, horses could never make their way. There are no roads, and even if there were, they would be so blocked with snow that no one could find them. So dogs are used. They are a different breed from any hereabout. Their long, thick coat, which keeps them so warm in the cold winter's nights, would be a dreadful burden in our hot summer. These dogs are taught to haul and harness, and they are very tough and strong and can go far further and more quickly than any horse. They are hitched to a sled, of course, in single file. The sled is made of a long board, turned up at one end for a sort of dashboard. Then, wrapped up in his thick fur rugs, the driver takes his seat on it, cracks his whip, and away they go. Sometimes, though, they do not get away so easily for some cross dog refuses to have his harness put on, and he has to be beaten thoroughly before he will submit. At times, long trains of dog sledges loaded with provisions set out for some far distant fort. At such times as these the drivers do not ride, but run alongside on snowshoes. They go at great speed on these and easily keep up with the dogs. 
Before daylight, they start out. At noon, a halt is made for an hour, and the men take a scanty lunch. Then they set off again. The twilight comes early in those northern lands, and as soon as it is too dark to see clearly, they halt for the night. The dogs are loosed from their harness and stand around looking on with great interest, for now they are to have the only meal they are allowed in the whole day. Two pounds of dried fish are given to each. It takes them only an instant to swallow it down. Then they walk about a little, hoping perhaps that there may be an unnoticed peace somewhere, or growling at one another and settling any little disputes that may have risen during the day. But soon they coil themselves up into a bunch and are fast asleep. The men, meanwhile, have been busily at work. One has cut down a tree for wood for a fire. Another, with his snowshoe, has scraped away the snow, so as to leave a large round place in the center of which the fire is made. Then the supper is cooked. After this is over, the men smoke their pipes and tell stories. But before long, they wrap themselves up in their robes and with their feet to the fire, go off to sleep. What fun that must be, said Rob. I would like to drive a dog team ever so much. How jolly to go sliding over the snow. It is not such good fun as you might think, said his mamma, for one sits on the very bottom of the sled, and if it goes over any ice hummocks, every jar shakes you, till you feel before night that every bone in your body will drop to pieces. Sometimes, too, the dogs give great trouble. They find out at once whether the person who is driving them knows his business, and if he does not, woe betide him. Perhaps while he thinks all is going on beautifully, they come suddenly upon some game. The startled deer raise their heads in astonishment for a moment, and then dash away. The sight is too much for the dogs. With barks and howls they dash away after them. In vain does the driver ply his whip. The dogs know that he is a green hand, and on they rush. The deer fly like the wind across the open glades and through the woods, and after them come the dogs. At last they come too near the edge of some hill. The sled loses its balance and slips, and away they go. Dogs, men, and sledge all head over hills and bring up in some snowbank at its foot. I wonder how the Eskimo and their dogs keep warm in the fearful winters they have, said Rob, as he looked at the blazing fire before him. The men and women are pretty thoroughly clothed in furs, said his mamma, and the dogs, as you know, carry their own furs. Besides, their houses are very warm, for they are built of ice, and the dogs, I fancy, share them with their masters. But I should think a house built of ice would be very cold, said Rob. Not at all, said his mamma. The Eskimo cut out blocks of snow and ice and build their homes in the shape of a dome. When it is warm, they leave out one block for a window, but if it be cold, they close it up. But how does the smoke get out? asked Rob. There is not much smoke, said his mamma, for they use a sort of lamp to heat the room, and as there is no ventilation, the heat of their bodies, added to that of the lamp, soon makes the house very hot and close. But how do they cook their food? he asked. They very seldom cook it at all said his mamma, but eat it raw. They think there is nothing so delicious as a piece of raw blubber. If a whale is thrown up on the beach by any chance, they fall upon it with their knives and eat without waiting for any cooking. Then they cut off what they can and carry it back to their houses. The dogs are always on hand at such times, for in those faraway lands food is not plenty, and the poor beasts often fare scantily. Often the men go to hunt walrus. They make their way out on some frozen bay until they find a hole in the ice which one of these animals has made in order to come to the top to breathe. Each man has a long spear in his hand and stands motionless with it ready to strike the moment the walrus comes to the surface. Pretty soon he comes. Down falls the spear and they dine that day on walrus. Well, for my part, said Rob, I am glad that I am neither an Eskimo nor an Eskimo dog. For my part, said Grace, who had come in, and had heard the latter part of what her mamma had been saying, I prefer cats to dogs. Cats are all very well, said Rob, very sagely, but I fear that most of them deserve the fate of Mother Tabbyskins. Who in the world was Mother Tabbyskins? asked Grace. 
Did you never hear of her? said Rob. It's a piece of poetry, and quite long, but this is a story. Mother Tabbyskins was an old cat, and a very wicked one. She used to spend her time in teaching kittens to spit and swear, which of course was very bad. One day she felt very ill, and said she was near her end. She got into bed, and begged them to send for a doctor. So Dr. Mouse was called in. But Tabby no sooner saw who her doctor was than she recovered at once and swallowed him at a gulp. Very soon after she was taken ill again, and one of the doctor called as before. This time Dr. Dog came. When Tabby saw him, she was seized with fear, and she had good cause to be, for he ate her up in no time, just as she had done Dr. Mouse. Oh, Pshaw, said Grace, that's just a make-believe story. No real cats do such things as teach kittens to swear. Why, when my pussy has young ones, they're as well behaved as can be. Often I have seen her box their ears when they didn't do as she wished. Yes, said Rob, but cats never do the clever things that dogs do. There are lots of stories telling of how they have saved their masters' lives. When some sudden snowstorm has come on the moors, and persons have lost their way, and overcome by the cold, have lain down to die. Their dogs have made their way to some house, and showing by their actions that their friends were in trouble, have brought them help. And only a day or two ago, Papa read us out of the paper how a dog caught a burglar. The thief was a fast runner, and was getting away from the policeman who was chasing him, when all at once a big Newfoundland rushed out from a brewery, and seizing the thief, knocked him down and stood growling over him until the policeman came up and seized him. Well, cats sometimes do clever things, said Grace. I know of a cat who lived on a farm. She was always fed at noon. To call them in to dinner, they used to ring a great bell. Pussy found that this bell meant dinner, and so whenever she was hungry, she used to go and reach up to it with her paw and ring it. Holo, said Rob suddenly. I do believe it has stopped snowing. Yes, he said, going to the window. It surely has. But the clouds are darker than ever. And there's a sleigh with a man in it stopped at our door. I'm going out to see what he wants. So saying, he ran out of the room, and seizing his hat from a peg in the hall, crammed it on his head, and opening the front door, ran out on the porch. When he was there, he saw that the man in the sleigh was the doctor's man. "'Are the roads bad?' he asked. "'Yes,' said the man. "'We had to walk all the way, "'but when we left the village "'they were just getting out the teams to break roads.' "'Where is the doctor?' asked Rob. "'In the house, talking with your father,' said the man. "'Very soon the two gentlemen came out, "'and the doctor got into the sleigh and drove slowly on, "'while Rob's father went back indoors "'to work at his sermon for Sunday. "'How white everything looked!' The trees were bent down under their load, and on the long hill the houses seemed to be half buried. The clouds were beginning to break away in the west. The storm was without doubt over. Rob stood on the porch, undecided what to do. On the hill he could see gangs of men with teams of oxen and heavy sleds breaking the roads. It would have been good fun to have been with them but it was pretty cold work standing still and watching from a distance, and he was just about to go in when he saw John come out of the barn, leading the two horses, each with his harness on. "'Where are you going, John?' he called. "'To the woods for a load of wood,' called back John, who seemed to have recovered his good temper and to be in a jolly state of mind. "'You can come and drive if you want to.' Nothing could have been more to Rob's mind than this. So dashing into the house for his coat and gloves, he ran and clambered up on the sled, gathering up the reins, ready to start. In a moment they were off, the horses stepping along briskly, though the snow was deep. Presently they left the highway and turned through a pair of bars into a large piece of woods. The snow had not drifted here at all, but lay evenly, covering up all the dead leaves and giving little white trimmings to all the tender shoots that raised their heads through it. They stopped before a great pile of logs, and the man, pushing off the snow with his foot, began to load them on the sled. Hello, said Rob, just as the last log was in its place. There goes a rabbit. I wish I could catch him. I caught many a one, and birds besides, when I was a lad, 
said John. How? asked Rob. In traps, said the man. I had traps all through the wood. I and another lad. We made quite a little money one winter selling the game we caught. A time like this would be fine for catching rabbits. All their food is covered up, you see, and they would be so glad to see a nice little sweet apple that they would never stop to see whether there was a trap near it or not. What fun it must have been, said Rob. Yes, said the man, but there was a vast deal of walking to be done. Some mornings I tramped nearly ten miles. In the spring, though, we got rather tired of trapping. It was much more fun, then, to go with the men sugaring. That was prime. They built a log hut, for sometimes they had to stay all night. We boys used to think that if we could only stay all night, we should have nothing more to wish for. Did you ever do it? asked Rob. Oh, yes. But we didn't care to after the first time, for the bunks were very hard, and we liked a comfortable bed at home better. I was reading a book the other day, said Rob, and it told about bird catching in the far north. It must be exciting work. A man sits across a stick on which a rope is tied, and then is lowered over the edge of a cliff by his friends on top. Sometimes he swings there in the air, a thousand feet, clear above the sea. If his head should get dizzy, and he should fall, it would be the end of him. He has a basket with him, and when he has filled it with eggs, the men above let down a light cord to which he ties the basket, and so they draw it up again. Sometimes he lands on a narrow ledge, and with a net on a long pole captures the seabirds that fly past. That must be exciting enough. Yes, said the man, but here we are at home, and there is your mamma calling you. End of Cats and Dogs Author Unknown The Child and the Pine Tree by Ethel Arthington Fielden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Many, many years ago, there was in a distant land a great kingdom which was governed by a powerful ruler who was so constantly waging war with other nations that he was very seldom in his own country. This king had a very beautiful wife who was shy and timid and almost afraid of her stern husband. He loved her dearly in his rough manner, but he never thought that she might be lonely at home alone while he was far away fighting in distant lands. Once, when he returned after a great victory, he found that during his long absence his gentle wife had quietly passed away and that a dear baby girl was his own little daughter. The king grieved for his wife, but after a short time went abroad to other countries, fighting always and seeming to forget all about his little baby at home. Years passed by, and the king did not return. The baby grew to be a gentle child, whose face always wore an expression of sadness, for she had never known either father or mother, never had a playmate of her own age in all her life, and had always lived alone in the cold stone castle, which crowned a high hill surrounded by forests. These forests were the delight of the child, for she knew and loved the first little spring violet which bloomed in the edges of the grim old woods. During the long summer days she really lived among the trees until the goldenrod and sumac came to tell her that summer was nearly gone and that winter would soon come and shut her up, a prisoner in the gray old castle again. Of all the trees of the forest, the child loved one little pine tree best. I believe it was because it grew in such a delightful spot, with soft green moss all covering the ground underneath it, and because it overlooked the distant ocean, where occasionally a great ship with white sails would go by. The pine tree and the child often talked together, and she, curling up in the moss at the foot of the pine, would put her arms around its trunk and tell it of her dreams and fancies and the pine would whisper back stories of its own life, how on the cold, cold winter nights, when the ground was all white with snow, and the whole world was still, the clear stars came out and twinkled in the dark sky, and told the little pine stories of other places, and the things they saw as they shone down into the different parts of the world. So, as time went on, 
the child and the pine tree became more and more fond of each other the birds fed out of the child's hand and the frisky little squirrels often played about her without the slightest fear one evening at the close of a hot summer day the child came into the forest intending to stay only a few moments to bid the trees and flowers good night she had never been in the forest at that time before and everything seemed strange she had not gone far however when she heard a voice in the breeze saying to her i am the spirit of the pine tree come little playmate to the gathering of the flowers and leaves and grass the child followed as if she were in a dream when she reached the pine tree there was the most wonderful sight she had ever dreamed of gathered around the little tree were fairies elves and flower spirits they were all having such a merry time that for a moment she stood unseen watching them while she was standing thus a tiny fairy in a gown of violet petals saw her and at once all the merry party came and took her to a beautiful little throne under the pine tree and bade her sit upon it then suddenly a hush fell upon them all and the spirit of the pine was heard saying this child shall evermore be queen of the trees and flowers she shall never be lonesome again for fairies elves and sprites shall always be ready to do her slightest bidding her every wish shall be granted and the trees of the forest shall always be her dearest friends when the voice had finished speaking all the fairies danced around the child and crowned her with a crown of violets and put into her hand a golden scepter with a tiny glittering star on the end and after this the child was never lonely again End of The Child and the Pine Tree by Ethel Arthington Fielden How the Alphabet Was Made From Just So Stories by Radyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The week after Taffy my Metulamai, we will still call her Taffy, best beloved, made that little mistake about her daddy's spear and the stranger man and the picture letter and all. She went carp fishing again with her daddy. Her mummy wanted her to stay at home and help hang up hides to dry on the big drying poles outside their Neolithic cave. But Taffy slipped away down to her daddy quite early and they fished. Presently, she began to be giggling. And her daddy said, Don't be silly, child. But isn't it inciting? said Taffy. Don't you remember how the head chief puffed out his cheeks? Pooh! And how the funny, nice stranger man looked with the mud in his hair? Well, do I? said Tegumai. I had to pay two deer skins, soft ones with fringes, to the stranger man for the things we did to him. We didn't do anything, said Taffy. It was Mummy and the other Neolithic ladies and the mud. We won't talk about that, said her daddy. Let's have lunch. Taffy took a marrow bone and sat mousy quiet for ten whole minutes while her daddy scratched on pieces of birch bark with a shark's tooth. Then she said, Daddy, I've think of a secret surprise. You make a noise, any sort of noise. Ah, oh, said Tegumai. Will that do to begin with? Yes, said Taffy. You look just like a codfish with its mouth open. Say it again, please. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh said her daddy. Don't be rude, my daughter. I'm not mean and rude, really and truly, said Daffy. It's part of my secret surprise think. Do say, ah, daddy, and keep your mouth open at the end and lend me that tooth. I'm going to draw a carp fish's mouth wide open. What for? said her daddy. Don't you see? said Daffy, scratching away on the bark. That will be a little secret surprise. 
when I draw a carp fish with its mouth open in the smoke at the back of our cave, if Mammy doesn't mind. It will remind you of that ah noise. Then we can play that it was me jumped out of the dark and surprised you with that noise, same as I did in a beaver swamp last winter. Really, said her daddy in the voice that grown-ups use when they are truly attending. Go on, Taffy. Oh, bother, she said. I can't draw all of a carpfish, but I can draw something that means a carpfish's mouth. Don't you know how they stand on their heads, rooting in the mud? Well, here's a pretense carpfish. We can play that the rest of him is drawn. Here's just his mouth, and that means ah. Oh. And she drew this. That's not bad, said Tegumai, and scratched on his own piece of bark for himself. But you've forgotten the feelers that hangs across his mouth. But I can't draw, Daddy. You needn't draw anything of him except just the opening of his mouth and the feeler across. Then we'll know he's a carpfish, because the perchers and trouts haven't got feelers. Look here, Taffy. And he drew this. Now I'll copy it, said Taffy. Will you understand this when you see it? Perfectly, said her daddy. And she drew this. And I'll be quite as surprised when I see it anywhere, as if you had jumped out from behind a tree and said, Ah! Now make another noise, said Taffy, very proud. Yah! said her daddy, very loud. Hmm! said Taffy. That's a mixy noise. The end part is a carpfish mouth. But what can we do about the front part? Ear, 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 and ah, yah. It's very like the carpfish mouth noise. Let's draw another bit of the carpfish and join him, said her daddy. He was quite incited too. No, if they're joined, I'll forget. Draw it separate. Draw his tail. If he's standing on his head, the tail will come first. Besides, I think I can draw tails easiest, said Taffy. A good notion, said Degumai. Here's a carpfish tail for the ear noise. And he drew this. I'll try now, said Taffy. Remember, I can't draw like you, Daddy. Will it do if I just draw the split part of the tail and the sticky down line for where it joins? And she drew this. Her daddy nodded and his eyes were shiny bright with excitement. That's beautiful, she said. Now make another noise, daddy. Oh, said her daddy very loud. That's quite easy, said Taffy. You make your mouth all round like an egg or a stone. So an egg or a stone will do for that. You can't always find eggs or stones. You'll have to scratch around something like one. And he drew this. My gracious, what a lot of noise pictures we've made. Carp mouth, carp tail and egg. Now make another noise, daddy. Sss, said her daddy and frowned to himself. But that he was too incited to notice. That's quite easy, she said, scratching on the bark. Uh, what? said her daddy. I meant I was thinking and didn't want to be disturbed. It's a noise just the same. It's a noise a snake makes, daddy, when it is thinking and doesn't want to be disturbed. Let's make the sh noise a snake. Will this do? And she drew this. There. That's another surprise secret, she said. When you draw a hissy snake by the door of your little back cave where you mend the spears, I'll know you're thinking hard and I'll come in most mousy quiet. And if you draw it on a tree by the river where you are fishing, I'll know you want me to walk most, most, most mousy quiet so as not to shake the banks. Perfectly true, said Tegumai. And there's more in this game than you think, Taffy dear. I have a notion that your daddy's daughter has hit upon the finest thing that there ever was since the tribe of Tegumai took to using shark's teeth instead of flints for their spa heads. 
I believe we found out the big secret of the world. Why? said Daffy, and her eyes too shone with excitement. I'll show, said her daddy. What's water in the Tegumai language? Yeah, of course, and it means river too, like Wagai Ya, the Wagai River. What is bad water that gives you fever if you drink it? Black water, swamp water. Yo, of course. Now look, said her daddy. Suppose you saw the scratched by the side of a pool in the beaver swamp. And he drew the cart tail and round egg. Two noises mixed. Yo, bad water, said Taffy. Of course, I won't drink that water because I know you said it was bad. But I needn't be near the water at all. Taffy drew the snake and the drying pole. Then she stopped. We must make a new picture for that end sound, mustn't we? Shoo, shoo, ooh, said her daddy. Why, it's just like the round egg sound made thin. Then suppose we draw a thin round egg and pretend it's a frog that hadn't eaten anything for years. No, said her daddy. If we drew that in a hurry, we might mistake it for the round egg itself. Shoo, shoo, shoo. I'll tell you what we do. We'll open a little hole at the end of the round egg to show that the O noise runs out all thin. Ooh, 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 like this. And he drew this. Oh, that's lovely. Much better than a thin frog. Go on, said Taffy, using her shark's tooth. Her daddy went on drawing and her hand shook with excitement. He went on till he had drawn this. Don't look up, Taffy, he said. Try if you can make out what that means in Tegumai language. If you can, we've found the secret. Snake, pole, broken egg, carp tail, and carp mouth, said Daffy. Shoo-ya, sky water, rain. Just then, a drop fell on her hand, for the day had clouded over. Why, Daddy, it's raining. Was that what you meant to tell me? Of course, said her daddy, and I told it to you without saying a single word, didn't I? Well, I think I would have known it in a minute, but that raindrop made me quite sure. I'll always remember now. Shuya means rain, or it is going to rain. Why, daddy? She got up and danced around him. Suppose you went out before I was awake and drawed Shuya in the smoke on the wall. I'd know it was going to rain, and I'd take my beaver skin hood. Won't mummy be surprised? Tegumai got up and danced as well. Daddies didn't mind doing those things in those days. More than that, more than that, he said. Suppose I wanted to tell you it wasn't going to rain much and you must come down to the river. What would we draw? Say the words in Tegumai talk first. Shu ya las, ya maru. Sky water ending, river come to. What a lot of new sounds. I don't see how we can draw them. But I do, I do, said Tegumai. Just attend a minute, Daffy, and we won't do any more today. We've got Shuya all right, haven't we? But this last is a teaser. La, 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 and he waved his shark tooth. There's the hissy snake at the end and the carp mouth before the snake. Ass, ass, ass. We only want la, 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 said Taffy. I know it, but we have to make Lala. And we're the first people in all the world who've ever tried to do it, Taffy Mai. Well, said Taffy, <sighs> yawning, for she was rather tired. Last means breaking or finishing, as well as ending, doesn't it? So it does, said Tegu Mai. Tolas means there's no water in the tank for mummy to cook with, just when I'm going hunting too. And Shilas means your spear is broken. Oh, if I'd only thought of that instead of drawing silly beaver pictures for the stranger. La, 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 said Tegumai, waving a stick and frowning. Oh, bother. I could have drawn she quite easily, Taffy went on. Then I'd have drawn your spear all broken, this way. And she drew. The very thing, said Tegumai. That's la all over. It isn't like any of the other marks either. And he drew this. Now for ya. Oh, we've done that before.
Now for Maru. Mum, 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 mum. Mum shuts one's mouth up, doesn't it? We'll draw a shut mouth like this. And he drew. Then the cart mouth open. That makes ma, 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 ma. But what about this ear thing, Taffy? It comes out all rough and edgy like your shark tooth saw when you're cutting out a plank for the canoe, said Taffy. You mean all sharp at the edges, like this, said Tegumai, and he drew. Exactly, said Taffy. But well, we don't want all those teeth. Only put in two. I'll only put in one, said Tegumai. If this game of ours is going to be what I think it will, the easier we make our sound pictures, the better for everybody. And he drew. Now I've got it, said Tegumai, standing on one leg. I'll draw him all in a string like fish. Hadn't we better put a little bit of stick or something between each word so they won't rub up against each other and jostle just the same as if they were scarps? Oh, I'll leave space for that, said her daddy. And very excitedly, he drew them all without stopping on a big new bit of birch bark. Shuyalasyamaru said Taffy, reading it out sound by sound. That's enough for today, said Tegumai. Besides, you're getting tired, Taffy. Never mind, dear, we'll finish it all tomorrow. And we'll be remembered for years and years and years after the biggest trees you can see are all chopped up for firewood. So they went home, and all evening, Tegumai sat on one side of the fire and Taffy on the other drawing yas and yos and shoes and shees and the smoke on the wall and giggling together till her mummy said, Really, Tegumai, you're worse than my Taffy. Please don't mind, said Taffy. It's only our secret surprise, mummy dear, and we'll tell you all about it the very minute it's done. But please don't ask me what it is now, or else I'll have to tell. So her mummy most carefully didn't. And bright and early next morning, Tegumai went down to the river to think about new sound pictures. And when Taffy got up, she saw Yalas. Water is ending or running out, chalked on the side of the big stone water tank outside the cave. Um, said Taffy, these picture sounds are rather a bother. Daddy's just as good as come here himself and told me to get more water for mummy to cook with. She went to the spring at the back of the house and filled the tank from a bark bucket. And then she ran down to the river and pulled her daddy's left ear, the one that belonged to her to pull when she was good. Now come along and we'll draw all the leftover sound pictures, said her daddy. And they had a most exciting day of it and a beautiful lunch in the middle and two games of romps. When they came to tea, Taffy said, as that was her name and her daddy's and her mummy's, and they all began with that sound, they should draw a sort of family group of themselves holding hands. That was all very well to draw once or twice, but when it came to drawing it six or seven times, Taffy and Tegumai drew it scratchier and scratchier, till at last the tea sound was only a long, thin Tegumai with his arms out to hold Taffy and Teshumai. You can see from these three pictures partly how it happened. Many of the other pictures were much too beautiful to begin with, especially before lunch. But as they were drawn over and over again on Birch Park, they became plainer and easier till at last even Tegumai said he could find no fault with them. They turned the hissy snake the other way around for the zzz sound to show it was hissing backwards in a soft and gentle way and they made just a twiddle for E, because it came into the pictures so often. And they drew pictures of the sacred beaver of the Tegumais for the b -b 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 sound. And because it was a lasty, nasty, nosy noise, they drew just noses for the end sound, till they were tired. And they drew a picture of the big lake pike's mouth, for the greedy g sound, and they drew the pike's mouth again with a spear behind it for the scratchy, hurty k sound. And they drew pictures of a little bit of the winding Wagai River for the nice, windy, windy w sound 
and so on and so forth and so following till they had done and drawn all the sound pictures that they wanted and there was the alphabet all complete and after thousands and thousands and thousands of years after hieroglyphics and demotics and niloptics and cryptics and cufics and runics and dorics and ionics and all sorts of other ricks and tricks because the wounds and negusis and akuns and repositories of tradition would never leave a good thing alone when they saw it the fine old easy understandable english and the rest of them got back into its proper shape again for all best beloveds to learn when they are old enough but i remember tegu my bopsulai and taffy my metulamai and tesho my tawindro her dear mummy and all the days gone by and it was so just so a little time ago on the banks of the big wagai of all the tribe of tegu my who cut that figure none remain on meru's down the cuckoo's cry the silence and the sun remain but as the faithful years return the hearts unwounded sing again comes taffy dancing through the fern to lead the surrey spring again her brows are bound with bracken fronds her golden elf locks fly above her eyes are bright as diamonds and bluer than the skies above in moccasins and deer skin cloak and fearing free and fair she flits and lights her little damp wood smoke to show her daddy where she flits for far or oh, very far behind so far she cannot call to him come stay go my alone to find the daughter that was all to him end of how the alphabet was made from just so stories by rudyard kipling how the first letter was written from just so stories by rudyard kipling this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to find out how you can volunteer please visit librivox.org how the first letter was written once upon a most early time was a neolithic man he was not a jute or an angle or even a dravidian which he might well have been best to pill up it but never mind why he was a primitive and he lived cavely in a cave and he wore very few clothes and couldn't read and he couldn't write and he didn't want to except when he was hungry he was quite happy his name was tegumai bopsulai and that means man who does not put his foot forward in a hurry but we o oh best beloved will call him tegumai for short and his wife's name was teshumai tevindro and that means lady who asks a very many questions but we o oh best beloved will call her teshumai for short and his little girl daughter's name was tafimai metalumai and that means small person without any manners who ought to be spanked but i'm going to call her taffy and she was tegu my bopsalai's best beloved and her own mummy's best beloved and she was not spanked half as much as was good for her and they were all three very happy as soon as taffy could run about she went everywhere with her daddy tegu my and sometimes they would not come home to the cave till they were hungry and then teshu my tevindro would say where in the world have you two been to to get so shocking dirty really my tikuma you know better than my taffy now attend and listen now one day tikuma bobsalai went down to the beaver swamp to the wagai river to spear carp fish for dinner and taffy went too tikuma spear was made of wood with shark teeth at the end and before he had caught any fish at all he accidentally broke it clean by jabbing down too hard on the bottom of the river they were miles and miles from home of course they had their lunch with them in a little bag and tegumai had forgotten to bring any extra spears here's a pretty kettle of fish said tegumai it will take me half the day to mend this there's your big black spear at home said taffy let me run back to the cave and ask mummy to give it to me it's too far for your little fat legs said tegumai 
Besides, you might fall into the beaver swamp and be drowned. We must make the best of a bad job. He sat down and took out a little leather mendy bag full of reindeer sinews and strips of leather and lumps of piece wax and resin and began to mend the spear. Taffy sat down too, with her toes in the water and her chin in her hand, and thought very hard. Then she said, I say, Daddy, it's an awful nuisance that you and I don't know how to write, isn't it? If we could, then we could send a message for the new spear. Taffy, said Tegumai, how often have I told you not to use slang? Awful isn't a pretty word, but it would be a convenience now that you mention it. If we could write home. Just then, a stranger man came along the river, but he belonged to a far tribe, the Tevaras, and he did not understand one word of Tegumai's language. He stood on the bank and smiled at Taffy, because he had a little girl daughter of his own at home. Tegumai drew a hank of deer sinews from his mendy bag and began to mend his spear. Come here, said Taffy. Do you know where my mummy lives? And the stranger man said, Um, being, you know, a Tiwara. Silly, said Taffy, and she stamped her foot because she saw a shoal of very big carp going up the river just when her daddy couldn't use his spear. Don't bother grown-ups, said Tegumai still busy with his spear mending that he did not turn around. I aren't. I only want him to do what I want him to do and he won't understand. Then don't bother me, said Tegumai, and he went on pulling and straining at the deer sinews with his mouth full of loose ends. The stranger man, a genuine Tawara was he, sat down on the grass and Taffy showed him what her daddy was doing. The stranger man thought, this is a very wonderful child. She stamps her foot at me and she makes faces. She must be the daughter of that noble chief who is so great that he won't take any notice of me. So he smiled more politely than ever. Now, said Taffy, I want you to go to my mummy because your legs are longer than mine and you won't fall into the beaver swamp and ask for daddy's other spear the one with the black handle that hangs over our fireplace. The stranger man, and he was a Tiwara, thought, this is a very, very wonderful child. She waves her arms and she shouts at me, but I don't understand a word of what she says. But if I don't do what she wants, I greatly fear that that haughty chief, man who turns his back on collars, will be angry. He got up and twisted a big flat piece of bark off a birch tree and gave it to Taffy. He did this, best beloved, to show that his heart was as white as the birch bark and that he meant no harm. But Taffy didn't quite understand. Oh, said she, now I see. You want my mummy's living address? Of course, I can't write but I can draw pictures if I've anything sharp to scratch with. Please lend me the shark's tooth of your necklace. The stranger man, and he was a Tawara, didn't say anything. So Taffy put up her little hand and pulled at the beautiful bead and seed shark tooth necklace around his neck. The stranger man, and he was a Tawara, thought, this is a very, very, very wonderful child. The shark's tooth on my necklace is a magic shark's tooth, and I was always told that if anyone touched it without my leave, they would immediately swell up or burst. But this child doesn't swell up or burst. And that important chief, man who attends strictly to his business, has not yet taken any notice of me at all, and doesn't seem to be afraid that she will swell up or burst. I had better be more polite. So he gave Taffy the shark's tooth and she lay down flat on her tummy with her legs in the air, like some people on the drawing room floor when they want to draw pictures. And she said, 
Now I'll draw you some beautiful pictures. You can look over my shoulder, but you mustn't chopper. First, I'll draw Daddy fishing. It isn't very like him, but Mummy will know, because I've drawn a spear all broken. Well, now I'll draw the other spear that he wants, the black handled spear. It looks as if it was sticking in Daddy's back, but that's because the shark tooth split, and this piece of bark isn't big enough. That's the spear I want you to fetch. So I'll draw a picture of me, myself, explaining to you. My hair doesn't stand up like I've drawn, but it's easier to draw that way. Now I'll draw you. I think you're very nice, really, but I can't make you pretty in the picture, so you must be fended. Are you fended? The stranger man, and he was a Tawara, smiled. He thought, There must be a big battle going to be fought somewhere, and this extraordinary child who takes my magic shark tooth but does not swell up or burst, is telling me to call all the great chief's tribe to help him. He's a great chief, or he would have noticed me. Look, said Daffy, drawing very hard and rather scratchily. Now I've drawn you, and I've put the spear that Daddy wants into your hand, just to remind you that you are to bring it. Now I'll show you how to find my mummy's living address. You go along till you come to two trees. Those are trees. Then you go over a hill. That's a hill. And then you come into a beaver swamp all full of beavers. I haven't put in all the beavers because I can't draw beavers. But I've drawn the heads and that's all you'll see of them when you cross the swamp. Mind you don't fall in. Then our cave is just beyond the beaver swamp. It isn't as high as the hills really but I can't draw things very well. That's my mummy outside. She is beautiful. She is the most beautifulest mummy there ever was. But she won't be offended when she sees I've drawn her so plain. She'll be pleased with me because I can draw. Now in case you forget, I've drawn the spear that daddy wants outside our cave. It's inside really, but you must show the picture to my mummy and she'll give it to you. I've made her holding up her hands because I know she'll be so pleased to see you. Isn't it a beautiful picture? And do you quite understand or shall I explain again? The stranger man, and he was a Tewara, looked at the picture and nodded very hard. He said to himself, If I do not fetch this great chief's tribe to help him, he will be slain by his enemies who are coming up on all sides with spears. Now I see why the great chief pretended not to notice me. He feared that his enemies were hiding in the bushes and would see him. Therefore, he turned to me his back and let the wise and wonderful child draw the terrible picture showing me his difficulties. I will get away and get help for him from his tribe. He did not even ask Taffy the road, but raced off into the bushes like the wind with the birch bark in his hand. And Taffy sat down most pleased. Now, this is the picture that Taffy had drawn for him. What have you been doing, Taffy? said Tegumai. He had mended his spear and was carefully waving it to and fro. It's a little berangement of my own daddy, dear, said Taffy. If you won't ask me any questions, you'll know about it in a little time and you'll be surprised. You don't know how surprised you'll be, daddy. Promise you'll be surprised? Very well, said Degumai and went on fishing. The stranger man, did you know he was a Tewara? Hurried away with the picture and ran for some miles. Till, quite by accident, he found Teshumai Tevendro at the window of her cave, talking to some other Neolithical ladies who had come in to a primitive lunch. Taffy was very like Teshumai, especially about the upper part of the face and eyes. For the stranger man, always a pure Tawara, smiled politely and handed Teshumai the birch bark. He had run hard so that he panted and his legs were scratched with brambles, but he still tried to be polite. As soon as Teshumai saw the picture, she screamed like anything and flew at the stranger man. The other ladies at once knocked him down and sat on him in a long line of six while Teshumai pulled his hair. It's as plain as the nose on the stranger man's face, she said. He has stuck my Teshumai all full of fears and frightened poor Taffy so that all her hair stand on end. And not content with that, 
he brings me a horrid picture of how it was done. Look! He showed the picture to all the Neolithical ladies, sitting patiently on the stranger man. Here is my Chegumai with her arm broken. Here is a spear sticking into his back. Here is a man with a spear ready to throw. And here is another man throwing a spear from a cave. And there are a whole pack of people. They were Taffy's beavers, really, but they did look rather like people. Coming up behind Tegumai, isn't it shocking? Most shocking, said the Neolithical ladies, and they filled the stranger man's hair with mud, at which he was surprised, and they beat upon the reverberating tribal drums and called together all the chiefs of the tribe of Tegumai, with the hetmans and dolmans, all Negusis, wounds and akuns, of the organization, in addition to the warlocks, angicocks, juju men, bonzes, and the rest, who decided that before they chopped the stranger man's head off, he should instantly lead them down to the river and show them where he had hidden poor Taffy. By this time, the stranger man, in spite of being a Tewara, was really annoyed. They had filled his hair quite solid with mud, and they had rolled him up and down on knobby pebbles. They had sat upon him in a long line of six. They had thumped him and bumped him till he could hardly breathe. And though he did not understand their language, he was almost sure that the names the Neolithic ladies called him were not ladylike. However, he said nothing till all of the tribe of Tegumai was assembled. And then he led them back to the bank of the Wagai River. And there they found Taffy making daisy chains and Tegumai carefully spearing small calf with his mended spear. Well, you have been quick, said Taffy. But why did you bring so many people? Daddy dear, this is my surprise. Are you surprised, Daddy? Very, said Tegumai. But it has ruined all my fishing for the day. Why, the whole dear, kind, nice, clean, quiet tribe is here, Taffy. And so they were. First of all walked Teshumai Tevindro and the Neolithic ladies, tightly holding on to the stranger man, whose hair was full of mud, although he was a Tewara. Behind them came the head chief, the vice chief, the deputy and assistant chiefs, all armed to the upper teeth, the hetmans, the heads of hundred, the platoffs with their platoons, and the dolmens with their detachments, wounds, negusis, and akuns ranking in the rear, still armed to the teeth. Behind them was the tribe in hierarchical order from owners of four caves, one for each season, a private reindeer run and two salmon leaps, to feudal and prognathous villains, semi-entitled to half a bearskin of winter nights, seven yards from the fire, and adscript serfs, holding the reversion of a scraped marrow bone under the heroid. Aren't those beautiful words, best beloved? They were all there, prancing and shouting, and they frightened every fish for 20 miles. And Tegumai thanked them in a fluid Neolithic oration. Then Teshumai Tevindro ran down and hugged and kissed Taffy very much indeed. But the head chief of the tribe of Tegumai took Tegumai by the top knot feathers and shook him severely. Explain, 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 cried all the tribe of Tegumai. Goodness sakes alive, said Tegumai. Let go of my top knot. Can't a man break his carp spear without the whole countryside descending on him? You are a very interfering people. I don't believe you've brought my daddy's black handled spear after all. And what are you doing to my nice stranger man? They were thumping him by twos and threes and tens till his eyes turned round and round. He could only gasp and point at Taffy. Where are the bad people who speared you, my darling? said Teshumai Tevindro. There weren't any, said Tegumai. My only visitor has been that poor fellow that you're trying to choke. Aren't you well or are you ill, O oh, tribe of Tegumai? He came with a horrible picture, said the head chief. A picture that showed you were quite full of spears. Um, perhaps it better explain that I gave him the picture, said Taffy, but she did not feel quite comfy. You, said the tribe of Tegumai altogether, small person with no manners who ought to be spanked, you? 
Explain, 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 said the head chief of the tribe of Tegumai, and he hopped on one foot. I wanted the stranger man to fetch daddy's spear, so I drawed it. There weren't a lot of spears. There was only one spear. I drawed it three times to make sure. I couldn't help it looking as if it had stuck into daddy's head. There wasn't much room on the birch bark. And those things that mummy called bad people are my beavers. I dropped them to show him the way through the swamp. And I draw down mummy at the mouth of the cave, looking pleased. Because he is a nice stranger man. I think you are just the stupidest people in the world. He is a very nice man. Why have you filled his hair with mud? Wash him. Nobody said anything for a long time. Till the head chief laughed. Ha ha. And then the stranger man, who was at least a Tawara, laughed. Ha ha ha! And then the Tegumai laughed till he fell down flat on the back. And then all the tribe laughed more and worse and louder. Ha 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 ha! The only people who did not laugh were Teshumai Tevindro and all the Neolithic ladies. They were very, very polite to all their husbands and said, Idiot! ever so often. Then the head chief of the tribe of Tegumai cried and sang, O oh, small person without any manners who ought to be spanked, you've hit upon a great invention. I didn't intend to. I only want a daddy's black handled spear, said Taffy. Never mind. It is a great invention, and some day men will call it writing. At present, it is only pictures, and as we have seen today, pictures are not always properly understood. But a time will come, O babe of Tegumai, where we shall make letters, all twenty-six of them, and we shall be able to read as well as to write, and then we shall always say exactly what we mean without any mistakes. Let the Neolithic ladies wash the mud out of the stranger's hair. I shall be glad of that, said Taffy, because after all, though you've got every single other spear in the tribe of Tegumai, you've forgotten my daddy's black-handled spear. Then the head chief cried aloud and said and sang, Taffy, dear, the next time you write a picture letter, you'd better send a man who can talk our language with it to explain what it means. I don't mind myself because I'm a head chief, but it's very bad for the rest of the tribe of Tegumai. And, as you can see, it surprises the stranger. Then they adopted the stranger man, a genuine Tewara of Tewar, into the tribe of Tegumai because he was a gentleman and did not make a fuss about the mud that the Neolithic ladies had put into his hair. But from that day to this, and I suppose it is all Taffy's fault, very few little girls have ever liked learning to read or write. Most of them prefer to draw pictures and play about with their daddies, just like Taffy. There runs a road by Merrow Down, a grassy track today it is, and our out of Guilford Town, above the river way it is. Here, when they heard the horse bells ring, the ancient Britons dressed and rode to watch the dark Phoenicians bring the goods along the western road. And here, or hereabouts, they met to hold their racial talks and jot, to barter beads for Whitby jet and tin for gay shell talks and such. But long and long before that time, when bison used to roam on it, the taffy and her daddy climbed that down and had their home on it. The beavers built in Broadstone Brook and made a swamp where Bramley stands, and bears from Shear would come and look at for Taffy Mai where Shamley stands. The way that Taffy called Wagai was more than six times bigger then, and all the tribe of Tegumai they cut a noble figure then. End of how the first letter was written by Rudyard Kipling from Just So Stories. How the Camel Got His Hump from Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Betsy Walker, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, this is the next tale, and it tells how the camel got his big hump. In the beginning of years, when the world was so new and all, 
and the animals were just beginning to work for man, there was a camel, and he lived in the middle of a howling desert because he did not want to work, and besides, he was a howler himself. So he ate sticks and thorns and tamarisks and milkweed and prickles, most excruciating idle, and when anybody spoke to him, he said, Humph! Just humph! And no more. Presently, the horse came to him on Monday morning with a saddle on his back and a bit in his mouth and said, Camel, oh camel, come out and trot like the rest of us. Humph! said the camel, and the horse went away and told the man. Presently, the dog came to him with a stick in his mouth and said, Camel, oh camel, come and fetch and carry like the rest of us. Humph! said the camel, and the dog went away and told the man. Presently, the ox came to him with a yoke on his neck and said, Camel, oh camel, come and plow like the rest of us. Humph, said the camel, and the ox went away and told the man. At the end of the day, the man called the horse and the dog and the ox together and said, Three, oh three, I'm very sorry for you, with the world so new and all, but that humph thing in the desert can't work or he would have been here by now. So I am going to leave him alone, and you must work double time to make up for it. That made the three very angry, with the world so new and all. And they held a palaver, and an indaba, and a panchayet, and a powwow on the edge of the desert. And the camel came chewing on milkweed, most excruciating idle, and laughed at them. Then he said, Humph! and went away again. Presently, there came along the jinn, in charge of all deserts, rolling in a cloud of dust. Jinns always travel that way, because it is magic. And he stopped to palaver and powwow with the three. Jinn of all deserts, said the horse, is it right for anyone to be idle with the world so new and all? Certainly not, said the jinn. Well, said the horse, there's a thing in the middle of your howling desert, and he's a howler himself with a long neck and long legs, and he hasn't done a stroke of work since Monday morning. He won't trot. Phew, said Jin, whistling. That's my camel for all the gold in Arabia. What does he say about it? He says, Humph, said the dog, and he won't fetch and carry. Does he say anything else? Only humph, and he won't plow, said the ox. Very good, said the jinn. I'll humph him if you will kindly wait a minute. The jinn rolled himself up in his dusk cloak and took a bearing across the desert and found the camel most excruciatingly idle, looking at his own reflection in a pool of water. My long and bubbling friend, said the jinn, what's this I hear of you doing no work with the world so new and all? Humph, said the camel. The jinn sat down with his chin in his hand and began to think a great magic, while the camel looked at his own reflection in the pool of water. You've given the three extra work ever since Monday morning, all on account of your excruciating idleness, said the jinn, and he went on thinking magics with his chin in his hand. Oomph, said the camel. I shouldn't say that again if I were you, said the jinn. You might say it once too often, Bubbles, I want you to work. And the camel said, Humph! again. But no sooner had he said it than he saw his back that he was so proud of, puffing up and puffing up into a great, big, lolloping hump. Do you see that? said the jinn. That's your very own hump that you've brought upon your very own self by not working. Today is Thursday and you've done no work since Monday, when the work began. Now you are going to work. How can I, said the camel, with this hump on my back? That's made a purpose, said the jinn, all because you missed those three days. You will be able to work now for three days without eating, because you can live on your hump, and don't you ever say I never did anything for you. Come out of the desert and go to the three and behave. Hump yourself. And the camel humped himself, hump and all, and went away to join the three. And from that day to this, the camel always wears a hump. We call it hump 
now, not to hurt his feelings. But he has never yet caught up with the three days that he missed at the beginning of the world, and he has never yet learned how to behave. The camel's hump is an ugly lump, which, well, you may see at the zoo. But uglier yet is the hump we get from having too little to do. Kitties and grown-ups, too, if we haven't enough to do, we get the hump, camellia's hump, the hump that is black and blue. We climb out of bed with a frowsly head and a snarly, yarly voice. We shiver and scowl and we grunt and we growl at our bath and our boots and our toys. And there ought to be a corner for me, and I know there is one for you. When we get the hump, camellia's hump, the hump that is black and blue. The cure for this ill is not to sit still or froust with a book by the fire, but to take a large hoe and a shovel also and dig till you gently perspire. And then you will find that the sun and the wind and the gin of the garden too have lifted the hump, the horrible hump, the hump that is black and blue. I get it as well as you if I haven't enough to do, we all get hump, camellia's hump, kitties and grown-ups too. End of How the Camel Got His Hump from Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling How the Whale Got His Throat from Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Walker, Santa Fe, New Mexico. In the sea, once upon a time, oh, my best beloved, there was a whale, and he ate fishes. He ate the starfish and the garfish, and the crab and the dab, and the place and the dace, and the skate and his mate, and the mackerel, and the pickerel, and the really, truly, twirly, whirly eel. All the fishes he could find in all the sea he ate with his mouth so, till at last there was only one small fish left in all the sea, and he was a small stoot fish, and he swam a little behind the whale's right ear, so as to be out of harm's way. Then the whale stood up on his tail and said, I'm hungry. And the small stoot fish said, in a small stoot voice, Noble and generous cetacean, have you ever tasted man? No, said the whale. What is it like? Nice, said the small stoot fish. Nice, but nubbly. Then fetch me some, said the whale, and he made the sea froth up with his tail. One at a time is enough, said the stoot fish. If you swim to latitude 50 north, longitude 40 west, that is magic, you will find, sitting on a raft, in the middle of the sea, with nothing on but a pair of blue canvas breeches, a pair of suspenders, you must not forget the suspenders, best beloved, and a jackknife, one shipwrecked mariner, who, it is only fair to tell you, is a man of infinite resource and sagacity. So the whale swam and swam to latitude 50 north, longitude 40 west, as fast as he could swim, and on a raft, in the middle of the sea, with nothing to wear except a pair of blue canvas breeches, a pair of suspenders, you must particularly remember the suspenders, best beloved, and a jackknife, he found one single solitary shipwrecked mariner trailing his toes in the water, he had his mummy's leave to paddle, or else he would never have done it, because he was a man of infinite resource and sagacity. Then the whale opened his mouth back and back and back until it nearly touched his tail, and he swallowed the shipwrecked mariner and the raft he was sitting on and his blue canvas breeches and the suspenders, which you must not forget, and the jackknife. He swallowed them all down into his warm, dark, inside cupboards. And then he smacked his lips so, 
and he turned round three times on his tail. But as soon as the mariner, who was a man of infinite resource and sagacity, found himself truly inside the whale's warm, dark inside cupboards, he stumped, and he jumped, and he thumped, and he bumped, and he pranced, and he danced, and he banged, and he clanged, and he hit, and he bit, and he leaped, and he creeped, and he prowled, and he howled, and he hopped, and he dropped, and he cried, and he sighed, and he crawled, and he bawled, and he stepped, and he leapt, and he danced hornpipes where he shouldn't, and the whale felt most unhappy indeed. Have you forgotten the suspenders? So, he said to the stute fish, This man is very nubbly, and besides, he is making me hiccup. What shall I do? Tell him to come out, said the stute fish. So, the whale called down his own throat to the shipwrecked mariner. Come out and behave yourself. I've got the hiccups. Nay, nay, said the mariner. Not so, but far otherwise. Take me to my natal shore and the white cliffs of Albion, and I'll think about it. And he began to dance more than ever. You had better take him home, said the stute fish to the whale. I ought to have warned you that he is a man of infinite resource and sagacity. So the whale swam and swam and swam with both flippers and his tail as hard as he could for the hiccups. And at last he saw the mariner's natal shore and the white cliffs of Albion, and he rushed halfway up the beach and opened his mouth wide and wide and wide and said, Change here for Winchester, Ashalot, Nashua, Keene, and the stations on the Fitchburg Road. And just as he said, Fitch, the mariner walked out of his mouth. But while the whale had been swimming, the mariner, who was indeed a person of infinite resource and sagacity, had taken his jackknife and cut up the raft into little square grating, all running crisscross, and he had tied it firm with his suspenders. Now you know why you were not to forget the suspenders. And he dragged that grating good and tight into the whale's throat, and there it stuck. Then he recited the following sloka, which, as you have not heard it, I will now proceed to relate. By means of a grating, I have stopped your aiding. For the mariner, he was also an Hibernian, and he stepped out on the shingle, went home to his mother, who had given him leave to trail his toes in the water, and he married and lived happily ever afterward. So did the whale. But from that day on, the grating in his throat, which he could neither cough up nor swallow down, prevented him eating anything except very, very small fish. And that is the reason why whales nowadays never eat men or boys or little girls. The small stute fish went and hid himself in the mud under the door sills of the equator. He was afraid that the whale might be angry with him. The sailor took the jackknife home. He was wearing the blue canvas breeches when he walked out on the shingle. The suspenders were left behind, you see, to tie the grating with, and that is the end of that tale. When the cabin portholes are dark and green because of the seas outside, when the ship goes whop with a wiggle between, and the steward falls into the soup tureen, and the trunks begin to slide, when Nursie lies on the floor in a heap, and Mummy tells you to let her sleep, and you aren't waked or washed or dressed, why, then you will know, if you haven't guessed, you're 50 north and 40 west. End of How the Whale Got His Throat from Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling Read by Betsy Walker, Santa Fe, New Mexico Little Bo Peep by Joseph Martin Kronheim this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chad Horner. Little Bo Peep, she lost her sheep and didn't know where to find them. Let them alone and they'll come home and bring their tails behind them. So runs the nursery rhyme. Little Bo Peep was a very nice little girl. 
her cheeks had a bloom on them like a lovely peach and her voice sounded like a sweet silver bell but though little bo peep was as good as she was beautiful she sometimes met with misfortunes that made her very sad once when she lost her sheep she was very doleful indeed and this is how it happened one summer evening when the sun was setting little bo peep who had to rise very early in the morning felt tired and sat down on a bank covered with daisies being very weary she soon fell fast asleep now the bell wreather of bo peep's flock was a most stupid and stubborn fellow i dare say you know that all the sheep in a flock will follow the bell wreather and that he always wears a bell round his neck it was a great pity but the bell wreather of bo peep's flock was very wild and was much given to wander far away into the wood where of course the rest of the sheep would follow him finding little bo peep asleep the tiresome fellow began by standing on his hind legs and making a great bow to his shadow before him on the grass after this he whirled himself round like a top shaking his head all the time and ringing his bell very soon the rest of the flock began to dance and caper too and when they had wheeled round their leader for a time they ran off after him with a bound into the wood away they went till they were quite tired out and then they came to a standstill staring at their leader with very blank faces but the weather weather looked foolish enough now and did nothing but shake his head slowly and ring his bell which seemed to say quite clearly you are lost you are lost when little bo peep awoke she found her sheep gone and hardly knowing what she did she walked on and on far into the wood she met some people with hoes and rakes in their hands and asked them if they had seen her sheep but they only laughed at her and said no one man was very cross and threatened to beat her at last she came to a stile on which the old raven was perched he looked so wise that little bo peep asked him whether he had seen a flock of sheep but he cried caw 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 so bo peep ran on again across the fields she wandered on till nightfall and being faint with hunger she was very glad to see a light just before her as she went on she saw that it shone from a cottage window but when she came to the door it looked so dark and dismal that she was afraid to go in and was just going to run away when a cross-looking old woman came out and dragged her into the cottage she made her sit by the side of her son who was a very ugly youth with a great red face and red hair the old woman told him that she had brought bo peep to his wife so bo peep who did not like him at all ran away while they were asleep but she did not know where to go and gave herself up for loss when she heard something cry to wit to woo in the tree above her it was a great owl which began flapping its wings with joy bo peep was frightened at first but as the owl seemed very kind she followed it it took her to a cottage where there was plenty to eat and drink and then to bo peep's great surprise it began to speak and told her this story no dear maiden said the owl that i am the daughter of a king and was a lovely princess but i was changed into an owl by an old woman at the cottage because i would not marry her ugly son but i have heard the fairies say that one day a lovely maiden who would come into this wood to find her lost sheep should be the means of my gaining my own form again you are that pretty maid and i will take you to a spot where you will find your sheep but without their tails the elves will play with them for this night but in the morning every sheep will have its tail again except the stupid bell weather you must then wave his tail three times over my head and i shall resume my shape again the owl flew off and led bo peep into the wood and said sleep maiden and i will watch how long she was asleep she could not tell but the charmed spot was suddenly lighted up and she saw the queen of the fairies seated on a bank the queen said the sheep should be punished for running away she then saw all her sheep come tripping into the place and on every sheep there was an elf who held in his hand a sheep's tail after riding them about for some time and having great fun with them the mad sport ceased and each elf restored the tail to his sheep all but the bell weathers which their leader hid in a tree when bo peep awoke she saw the owl flapping its wings as if to remind her of her promise so she fetched the tail and waved it three times over its head when up started the most charming princess that ever was seen the princess gave bo peep a beautiful cottage and her sheep never ran away from their kind mistress again End of little bo peep by joseph martin cronheim
The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Most terribly cold it was. It snowed and was nearly quite dark and evening, the last evening of the year. In this cold and darkness there went along the street a poor little girl, bareheaded and with naked feet. When she left home she had slippers on, it is true, but what was the good of that? They were very large slippers which her mother had hitherto worn. So large were they, and the poor little thing lost them as she scuffled away across the street because of two carriages that rolled by dreadfully fast. One slipper was nowhere to be found. The other laid hold of by an urchin, and off he ran with it. He thought it would do capitally for a cradle when he some day or other should have children himself. So the little maiden walked on with her tiny naked feet that were quite red and blue from cold. She carried a quantity of matches in an old apron, and she held a bundle of them in her hand. Nobody had bought anything of her the whole live-long day. No one had given her a single farthing. She crept along, trembling with cold and hunger, a very picture of sorrow, the poor little thing. The flakes of snow covered her long, fair hair, which fell in beautiful curls around her neck. But of that, of course, she never once now thought. From all the windows the candles were gleaming, and it smelt so deliciously of roast goose, for you know it was New Year's Eve. Yes, of that she thought. In a corner formed by two houses, of which one advanced more than the other, she seated herself down and cowered together. Her little feet she had drawn close up to her, but she grew colder and colder, and to go home she did not venture, for she had not sold any matches and could not bring a farthing of money. From her father she would certainly get blows, and at home it was cold too, for above her she had only the roof, through which the wind whistled, even though the largest cracks were stopped up with straw and rags. Her little hands were almost numbed with cold. Oh, a match might afford her a world of comfort if she only dared to take a single one out of the bundle, draw it against the wall, and warm her fingers by it. She drew one out. Rished! How it blazed! How it burned! It was a warm, bright flame, like a candle, as she held her hands over it. It was a wonderful light. It seemed really to the little maiden as though she were sitting before a large iron stove with burnished brass feet and a brass ornament at top. Fire burned with such blessed influence. It warmed so delightfully. The little girl had already stretched out her feet to warm them too, but the small flame went out. The stove vanished. She had only the remains of the burnt-out match in her hand. She rubbed another against the wall. It burned brightly, and where the light fell on the wall, there the wall became transparent like a veil, so that she could see into the room. On the table was spread a snow-white tablecloth. Upon it was a splendid porcelain service and the roast goose was steaming famously with its stuffing of apple and dried plums. And what was still more capital to behold was, the goose hopped down from the dish, reeled about on the floor with knife and fork in its breast, till it came up to the poor little girl when the match went out, and nothing but the thick, cold, damp wall was left behind. She lighted another match. Now there she was sitting under the most magnificent Christmas tree. It was still larger and more decorated than the one which she had seen through the glass door in the rich merchant's house. Thousands of lights were burning on the green branches, 
and gaily colored pictures, such as she had seen in the shop windows, looked down upon her. The little maiden stretched out her hands towards them when the match went out. The lights of the Christmas tree rose higher and higher. She saw them now as stars in heaven. One fell down and formed a long trail of fire. Someone is just dead, said the little girl, for her old grandmother, the only person who had loved her and who was now no more, had told her that when a star falls, a soul ascends to God. She drew another match against the wall. It was again light, and in the luster there stood the old grandmother, so bright and radiant, so mild, and with such an expression of love. Grandmother, cried the little one, oh, take me with you. You go away when the match burns out. You vanish like the warm stove, like the delicious roast goose, and like the magnificent Christmas tree. And she rubbed the whole bundle of matches quickly against the wall, for she wanted to be quite sure of keeping her grandmother near her. And the matches gave such a brilliant light that it was brighter than at noonday. Never formerly had the grandmother been so beautiful and so tall. She took the little maiden on her arm. Both flew in brightness and in joy so high so very high, and then above was neither cold, nor hunger, nor anxiety. They were with God. But in the corner, at the cold hour of dawn, sat the poor girl, with rosy cheeks, and with a smiling mouth, leaning against the wall, frozen to death on the last evening of the old year. Stiff and stark sat the child there, with her matches, of which one bundle had been burned. She wanted to warm herself, people said. No one had the slightest suspicion of what beautiful things she had seen. No one even dreamed of the splendor in which, with her grandmother, she had entered on the joys of a new year. End of The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Kyle Lavitt Little Red Riding Hood by Charles Hiddell. Translated by Charles Welsh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chad Horner. Once upon a time, there lived in a certain village a little country girl, the prettiest creature that ever was seen. Her mother was very fond of her, and her grandmother loved her still more. This good woman made for her a little red riding hood, which became the girl so well that everybody called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother, having made some custards, said to her, Go, my dear, and see how your grandmother does, for I hear she has been very ill. Carry her a custard and this little pot of butter. Little Red Riding Hood set out immediately to go to her grandmother's, who lived in another village. As she was going through the wood, she met Gaffer Wolf who had a very great mind to eat her up, but he dared not, because of some faggot-makers hard by in the forest. He asked her whether she was going. The poor child, who did not know that it was dangerous to stay and hear a wolf talk, said to him, I am going to see my grandmother and carry her a custard and a little pot of butter from my mamma. Does she live far off? said the wolf. Oh, yes, answered Little Red Riding Hood. It is beyond that mill you see there, the first house you come to in the village. Well, said the wolf, I'll go and see her too. I'll go this way and you go that, and we shall see who will be there first. The wolf began to run as fast as he could, taking the shortest way, and the little girl went by the longest way, amusing herself by gathering nuts, running after butterflies, and making nosegays of such little flowers as she met with. The wolf was not long before he reached the old woman's house. He knocked at the door, tap, tap, tap. Who's there? called the grandmother. Your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, replied the wolf, imitating her voice. Who has brought a custard and a little pot of butter sent to you by Mamma? The good grandmother, 
who was in bed, because she was somewhat ill, cried out, Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up. The wolf pulled the bobbin, and the door opened. He fell upon the good woman, and ate her up in no time, for he had not eaten anything for more than three days. He then shut the door, went into the grandmother's bed, and waited for little Red Riding Hood, who came some time afterward, and knocked at the door, tap, tap, tap. Who's there? cried the wolf. Little Red Riding Hood, hearing the big voice of the wolf, was up first afraid, but thinking her grandmother had a cold, answered, "'Tis your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, who has brought you a custard and a little pot of butter sent to you by Mamma." The wolf cried out to her, softening his voice a little, "'Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up.' Little Red Riding Hood pulled the bobbin, and the door opened. The wolf, seeing her come in, said to her, hiding himself under the bedclothes, put the custard and the little pot of butter upon the still and come and lie down with me little red riding hood undressed herself and went into bed where she was much surprised to see how her grandmother looked in her night clothes she said to her grandmamma what great arms you have got that is the better to hug thee my dear grandmamma what great legs you have got that is to run the better my child grandmamma what great ears you have got that is to hear the better, my child. Grandmama, what great eyes you have got. It is to see the better, my child. Grandmama, what great teeth you have got. That is to eat thee up. And saying these words, this wicked wolf fell upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her all up. End of Little Red Riding Hood by Charles Hero. Translated by Charles Welsh. The dreadful story of Pauline and the matches. Mamma and nurse went out one day and left Pauline alone at play. Around the room she gaily sprang, clapped her hands and danced and sang. Now on the table close at hand, a box of matches chanced to stand, and kind mamma and nurse had told her that if she touched them they would scold her. But Pauline said, Oh, what a pity, for when they burn it is so pretty. They crackle so and spit and flame, and mamma often burns the same. I'll only light a match or two, as I have often seen my mother do. When Miss and Mons, the cats, heard this, they said, Oh, naughty, naughty, miss! Meow, they cried, meow, meo. You'll burn to death if you do so. Mamma forbids it, don't you know? But Pauline would not take advice. She lit a match, it was so nice. It crackled so, it burned so clear, exactly like the picture here. She jumped for joy and ran about, and was too pleased to put it out. When Mins and Mons, the cats, saw this, they said, Oh, naughty, naughty, miss, and raised their paws and stretched their claws. Tis very, very wrong, you know. Meow, 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 meow. You will be burnt if you do so. Mamma forbids it, don't you know? Now see, oh, see, a dreadful thing. The fire has caught her apron string. Her apron burns, her arms, her hair. She burns all over everywhere. Then how the pussy cats did mew. What else, per pussies, could they do? They screamed for help, twas all in vain. So then they said, We'll scream again. Make haste, make haste. Meow, meow. She'll burn to death, we told her so. Pauline was burnt with all her clothes, and arms and hands and eyes and nose, till she had nothing more to lose except her little scarlet shoes, and nothing else but these was found among her ashes on the ground. And when the good cat sat beside the smoking ashes, how they cried, Meow, 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 meow. What will Mamma and Nursery do? Their tears ran down their cheeks so fast they made a little pond at last. End of The Dreadful Story of Pauline and the Matches by Henrik Hoffman Sunbeam and Zephyr by J. Randolph Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sunbeam and Zephyr, Chapter 1 They named him Zephyr because he was like the wind that rustles the leaves, bends over the lily bells, and makes the tall pines sing. Zephyr was a prince among the fairies. He was strong and big for a fairy, nearly two inches tall. Although he was young, he had done great deeds. Once, with his sharp sword, he had slain a grasshopper. 
At another time he had driven a whole kingdom of ants from an ant hill, and Zephyr was so clever that all the fairies would sit still and listen when he began to talk. Oh, the funny stories he could tell! Even the grave old men, like the prime minister, would hold their sides and laugh. Zephyr loved Sunbeam, because she had pink cheeks like the sweet arbutus, eyes blue as the sky, and hair as yellow as the golden sunshine. She was so small that she could lie down in the petal of a rose, and often went to sleep curled up for the night in a honeysuckle blossom. All the fairies loved her, too, because she was so kind and good. She was their queen, and they obeyed her. These fairies lived in the woods, and seldom went outside, so Sunbeam, although a queen, had never been beyond the long shadow where the sun goes down at night. Before twilight, all the fairies went to bed. They liked best to sleep in the morning glories, for they made such nice beds, and they shut up so tightly at just the right time for little fairies to go to sleep. Then the morning glories would open when the sun came up and would tumble the sleepy little fairies out on the grass and just laugh to see the little sleepy heads rub the dew out of their eyes and try to be wide awake. Once, ever so long before, Sunbeam had had a dreadful experience. Her two uncles, Sunflower and Hollyhock, had warned her that she must go to bed early, but one day she thought that, since she was queen, she wouldn't let even her prime ministers tell her what to do, so she stayed up very late. It was almost half past six. Hollyhock and Sunflower were very much worried and kept saying, Please run and get inside that wild rose and go to sleep, Sunbeam. But Sunbeam wouldn't, because she was a very willful little fairy. Then Trixie, Sunbeam's dearest little friend and one of her ladies-in-waiting, said, Oh, how funny you look, Sunbeam. Sunbeam said, I don't look funny at all. Just the same, she ran to the fountain, for the fountain was her favorite mirror, and looked into it. And such a sight! Instead of a rosy-cheeked, chubby little fairy, all she could see was a pale, thin little fairy, so pale and so thin that she wouldn't have known herself if it hadn't been for the dent in her chin where a dimple had always been. Oh, but Sunbeam was frightened. Run quick, Sunbeam, said Hollyhock. You're growing thinner every minute. Sunbeam looked, and she could see that she was growing thinner, so she ran and ran as fast as ever she could, and jumped right into the wild rose, and hid her dear little eyes in the soft pink petal, and fell fast asleep. When she woke, she ran and looked in the fountain again, the very first thing, and you can be sure she was glad to find that she looked like herself once more. But after that, Sunbeam never tried to stay up late. Chapter 2 Zephyr loved Sunbeam and wanted to marry her, but she longed to see the world and told him he must wait until she had made a trip around it. Zephyr coaxed and begged her to stay at home, but nothing he could say would change her mind, for she was determined to take the journey. So she called the servants and ordered them to harness two of her largest, handsomest and swiftest bumblebees to her rose-leaf carriage. Then, dressed in a lovely yellow gown made of butterflies' feathers, she stepped into her carriage, waved her hand, and with a loud buzzing noise away flew her black and yellow team. The fairies watched her, straining their eyes, till she disappeared over the treetops. And then they all cried and felt so badly that they nearly wept their eyes out. Oh, what will become of our beautiful sunbeam? they cried. Will she ever come back to us? I will go after her, said Zephyr. Bring me my swift hornet. So he mounted his black steed, and with a fierce buzzing, the hornet darted off. He soon overtook Sunbeam, for his hornet could fly much faster than her bumblebees, and he was almost up to her rose-leaf carriage when she drove her tired bumblebees into a lovely red clover field. 
she had never seen red clover before as they do not grow in the forest and the sight was a great treat to her as well as to the tired and hungry bumblebees she unfastened them from the carriage to let them eat all the honey they wanted and they just ate and ate until they tumbled off the clover blossoms to the ground they were so full now what shall i do cried sunbeam i can't get my bumblebees to go and she tugged at them and coaxed and scolded but it was no use they were fast asleep poor sunbeam sat down on a clover leaf and felt so tired and sorry that she cried until she too fell asleep chapter three when zephyr alighted from his black hornet he found sunbeam asleep on the clover leaf and not having the heart to awaken her he bent over her and kissed her cheek and then went round to the opposite side of the clover blossom where he would be entirely hidden when she opened her eyes just then a dewdrop that hung directly over sunbeam's head was shaken and it fell right on her face and so nearly drowned her that she awoke with a start to find herself alone zephyr kept as quiet as he could for some time but his poor little sunbeam was crying so hard that he finally came out of his hiding place and said my dear sunbeam i am here to take you home at first she was so glad to see him that she almost fell off the clover leaf right on the bumblebees but zephyr caught her in his arms please can't you wake up my bumblebees she sobbed i will try said zephyr but you do not need them for you can ride behind me on the hornet no no i must go on my journey she said and seeing her determined to have her own way he tried to wake the drowsy bumblebees he shook them and pounded them with the long grass and grew all out of breath shouting at them but they would not open their eyes he sat down to rest himself and as he was wondering what he could do next he too fell asleep by and by the bees awoke of their own accord so sunbeam harnessed them and started off again for she knew that zephyr would ride his favourite hornet after her before she could get far away soon she saw a beautiful wide field and guided her bumblebees into it this field was also all clover only it was white clover it stretched away off ever so far till sunbeam could not see the end of it the air was sweet with perfume so that she entirely forgot the unhappy time in the red clover suddenly the bees started so swiftly that she became frightened and in spite of all her efforts to stop them they flew faster and faster until she could see nothing but a dim white mass all around her then with a thump they struck a hard board fence and fell to the ground and poor little sunbeam was thrown from her rose-leaf carriage and nearly stunned by the fall when she could open her eyes she saw that the poor bumblebees were dead and then she knew that her journey was at an end and that perhaps she could never get home again chapter four while sunbeam was sitting among the white clover sobbing as though her heart would break she heard a strange noise it was different from any noise she had ever heard before it grew louder and louder and poor little sunbeam became very much frightened just as fast as she could she climbed up the slippery stem of a white clover and tiptoed across the top of the blossom and looked and what do you think she saw something big and white coming towards her sometimes it would come straight towards her and then it would fall down and all the clover would be crumbled then sunbeam heard a big voice say come baby dear baby thought sunbeam that is not a baby that is a giant more than a hundred hundred times as big as a fairy sunbeam was so frightened that she climbed down from the clover blossom and ran as fast as she could then she fell down and tore her pretty yellow dress on a blade of grass that made her cry again for it was her prettiest dress all made of butterflies wings poor sunbeam thought oh if zephyr would only come and she began to call zephyr zephyr 
Luckily, Zephyr was not very far away, and when he heard her call, it was not very long before he discovered her and placed her behind him on the hornet. Together they flew swiftly over the fields and rivers till they reached their own woods. The fairies were so happy over Sunbeam's return that they sang and danced and began to prepare a great banquet on the largest oak leaf they could find. Chapter 5 First, however, they all formed into line, and with twelve lovely little fairy maidens leading the way, went to Jack in the pulpit, who married Zephyr and Sunbeam. Sunbeam had on a sweet little dress made of daisy petals, and Zephyr had the cunningest black velvet suit made from a bumblebee's coat. After the wedding they marched back to where the dinner was spread on the oak leaf. After dinner the fairies called so loudly for a speech from Zephyr that at last he climbed up on a chestnut and began to speak. What he said was very funny, and a red squirrel came out from a tree overhead to see why the fairies were laughing so hard and so merrily. The little red squirrel was very glad to have a chance to see the fairies, for usually when they heard him coming they always hid. But now Zephyr's speech was so funny that they didn't hear the red squirrel at all. The red squirrel thought, oh, I wish the fairies would invite me to their party. He saw one little fairy next to Sunbeam, who had lovely velvety eyes, and he thought she was the dearest little thing he had ever seen. It was Trixie, Sunbeam's dearest friend, the naughtiest, most mischievous little fairy in the world. Sunbeam adored Trixie because Trixie could think of so many funny things to do. When the red squirrel saw Trixie, he thought he simply must go to the party. He began to laugh and chatter too, and ran out on a limb directly over their heads so he could listen better to the speech. Here he got to laughing so heartily that he lost his balance and fell right off the limb, which frightened the fairies so much that they ran and hid away under the leaves. The little red squirrel cannot find them now, and neither can you nor I. End of Sunbeam and Zephyr by J. Randolph Brown The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Every afternoon, as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a lovely garden, with soft green grass. Here and there, over the grass, stood beautiful flowers, like stars. And there were twelve peach trees that, in the springtime, broke out into delicate blossoms of pink and pearl, and in the autumn bore rich fruit. The birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them. How happy we are here, they cried to each other. One day the giant came back. He had been to visit his friend the Cornish ogre and had stayed with him for seven years. After the seven years were over, he had said all that he had to say, for his conversation was limited and he determined to return to his own castle. When he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? He cried in a very gruff voice, and the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. Anyone can understand that, and I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. So he built a high wall all around it and put up a notice board. Trespassers will be prosecuted. He was a very selfish giant. The poor children had now nowhere to play. They tried to play on the road, but the road was very dusty and full of hard stones, and they did not like it. They used to wander round the high wall when their lessons were over and talk about the beautiful garden inside. How happy we were there! they said to each other. Then the spring came, and all over the country were little blossoms and little birds. Only in the garden of the selfish giant it was still winter. 
The birds did not care to sing in it, as there were no children, and the trees forgot to blossom. Once a beautiful flower put its head out from the grass, but when it saw the notice board, it was so sorry for the children that it spat into the ground and went off to sleep. The only people who were pleased were the snow and the frost. Spring has forgotten this garden, they cried, so we will live here all year round. The snow covered up the grass with her great white cloak, and the frost painted all the trees silver. Then they invited the north wind to stay with them, and he came. He was wrapped in furs, and he roared all day about the garden, and blew the chimney pots down. This is a delightful spot, he said. We must ask the hail on a visit. So the hail came. Every day for three hours he rattled on the roof of the castle till he broke most of the slates, and then he ran round and round the garden as fast as he could go. He was dressed in grey, and his breath was like ice. I cannot understand why the spring is so late in coming, said the selfish giant, as he sat at the window and looked out at his cold white garden. I hope there will be change in the weather. But the spring never came, nor the summer. The autumn gave golden fruit to every garden, but to the giant's garden she gave none. He is too selfish, she said. So it was always winter there, and the north wind, and the hail, and the frost, and the snow danced about through the trees. One morning the giant was lying awake in bed when he heard some lovely music. It sounded so sweet to his ears that he thought it must be the king's musicians passing by. It was really only a little linnet singing outside his window, but it was so long since he had heard a bird sing in his garden that it seemed to him to be the most beautiful music in the world. Then the hail stopped dancing over his head, and the north wind ceased roaring, and a delicious perfume came to him through the open casement. I believe the spring has come at last, said the giant, and he jumped out of bed and looked out. What did he see? He saw a most wonderful sight. Through a little hole in the wall the children had crept in, and they were sitting in the branches of the trees. In every tree that he could see there was a little child, and the trees were so glad to have the children back again that they had covered themselves with blossoms and were waving their arms gently above the children's heads. The birds were flying about and twittering with delight, and the flowers were looking up through the green grass and laughing. It was a lovely scene. Only in one corner it was still winter. It was the farthest corner of the garden, and in it was standing a little boy. He was so small that he could not reach up to the branches of the tree, and he was wandering all around it, crying bitterly. The poor tree was still covered with frost and snow, and the north wind was blowing and roaring above it. Climb up, little boy, said the tree, and it bent its branches down as low as it could, but the boy was too tiny. And the giant's heart melted as he looked out. How selfish I have been! He said, now I know why the spring would not come here. I will put that little boy on top of the tree, and then I will knock down the wall, and my garden shall be the children's playground for ever and ever. He was really very sorry for what he had done. So he crept downstairs and opened the front door quite softly and went out into the garden. But when he, the children saw him, they were so frightened that they all ran away and the garden became winter again. Only the little boy did not run, for his eyes were so full of tears that he did not see the giant coming, and the giant stole up behind him and took him gently in his hand and put him up into the tree, and the tree at once broke into blossom, and the birds came and sang on it, and the little boy stretched out his two arms and flung them round the giant's neck and kissed him, and the other children when they saw that the giant was not wicked any longer, came running back, and with them came the spring. It is now your garden, little children, 
said the giant, and he took a great axe and knocked down the wall. And when the people were going to market at twelve o'clock, they found the giant playing with the children in the most beautiful garden they had ever seen. All day long they played, and in the evening they came to bid the giant goodbye. But where is your little companion? he said. The boy I put into the tree. The giant loved him the best because he had kissed him. We don't know, answered the children. He has gone away. You must tell him to be sure to come here tomorrow, said the giant. But the children said that they did not know where he lived and had never seen him before, and the giant felt very sad. Every afternoon, when school was over, the children came and played with the giant, but the little boy whom the giant loved was never seen again. The giant was very kind to all the children, yet he longed for his first little friend, and he often spoke of him. How I would like to see him, he used to say. Years went over, and the giant grew very old and feeble. He could not play about any more, so he sat in a huge armchair and watched the children at their games and admired his garden. I have many beautiful flowers, he said, but the children are the most beautiful flowers of all. One winter morning, he looked out of his window as he was dressing. He did not hate the winter now, for he knew that it was merely the spring asleep, and that the flowers were resting. Suddenly, he rubbed his eyes in wonder, and looked and looked. It certainly was a marvellous sight. In the farthest corner of the garden was a tree, quite covered with lovely white blossoms. Its branches were all golden, and silver fruit hung down from them and underneath it stood the little boy he had loved. Downstairs ran the giant in great joy and out into the garden. He hastened across the grass and came near to the child, and when he came quite close, his face grew red with anger, and he said, Who hath dared to wound thee? For on the palms of the child were the prints of two nails, and the prints of two nails were on the little feet. Who hath dared to wound thee? cried the giant. Tell me that I might take my big sword and slay him. Nay, answered the child, but these are the wounds of love. Who art thou? said the giant, and a strange awe fell on him, and he knelt before the little child. And the child smiled on the giant and said to him, You let me play once in your garden. Today you shall come with me to my garden, which is paradise. And when the children ran in the afternoon, they found the giant laying dead under the tree, all covered with white blossoms. End of the Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde Read by Anna Pinto The Tale of Mrs. Tingy Winkle by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chad Horner. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Lucy, who lived at a farm called Little Town. She was a good little girl, only she was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day, little Lucy came into the farmyard crying, "Oh, she did cry so! I've lost my pocket hankin, three hankins and a penny. Have you seen them, Tabby Kitten?" The kitten went on washing her white paws, so Lucy asked a speckled hen, Sally Henny Penny, have you found three pocket handkins? But the speckled hen ran into a barn, clucking, I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin, sitting on a twig. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. Lucy climbed upon the stile and looked up at the hill behind Little Town, a hill that goes up, up into the clouds as though it had no top, and a great way up the hillside she thought she saw some white things spread upon the grass. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her. She ran along a steep pathway up and up until Little Town was right away down below. She could have dropped a pebble down the chimney. Presently she came to a spring, bubbling out from the hillside. Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water, but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup, and where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. 
Lucy ran on and on. The path ended under a big rock. The grass was short and green, and there were clothes, props cut from bracken stems, with lines of plaited brushes, and a heap of tiny clothes pins, but no pocket handkerchiefs. But there was something else, a door, straight into the hill, and inside it someone was singing, Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between, oh, smooth and hot, red rusty spot, never here be seen, oh. Lucy knocked once, twice, and interrupted the song. A little frightened voice called out, Who's that? Lucy opened the door, and what do you think there was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen with a flagged floor and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen, only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small, and so was everything there. There was a nice hot, singy smell, and at the table, with an iron in her hand, stood a very stout short person, staring anxiously at Lucy. Her print gown was tucked up, and she was wearing a large apron over her striped petticoat. Her little black nose went sniffle, 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 and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and underneath her cap, where Lucy had yellow curls, that little person had prickles. Who are you? said Lucy. Have you seen my pocket pinkins? The little person made a bob curtsy. Oh yes, if you please him. My name is Mrs. Tingy Twinkle. Oh yes, if you please him. I'm an excellent clear starcher, and she took something out of a clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. What's that thing? said Lucy. That's not my pocket hankin. Oh no, if you please him. That's a little scarlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin, and she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. Then she took something else off a clothes horse. That isn't my penny, said Lucy. Oh no, if you please him. That's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tingywinkle. Mrs. Tingywinkle's nose went sniffle, 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 and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and she fetched another hot iron from the fire. There's one of my pocket hankins, cried Lucy, and there's my penny. Mrs. Tingywinkle ironed it, and goffered it, and shook out the frills. Oh, that is lovely, said Lucy. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Henny Penny. Look how she's worn the heels out with scratching in the yard. She'll very soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tingywinkle. Why, there's another handkerchief, but it isn't mine, it's red. Oh no, if you please em, that one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit, and it did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately, I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine, said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. There's my last pocket hankin, said Lucy. And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? They're little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Most terrible tickler, said Mrs. Tingywinkle. Now I've finished my ironing, I'm going to air some clothes. What are these dear soft fluffy things, said Lucy? Oh, those are woolly coats belonging to the little lambs at Skelgill. Will their jackets take off, asked Lucy. Oh yes, if you please em. Look at the sheep mark on the shoulder and here's one marked for Gatesgarth, and three that come from Little Town. They're always marked at washing, said Mrs. Tingywinkle, and she hung up all sorts and sizes of clothes, small brown coats of mice, and one velvety black moleskin waistcoat, and a red tailcoat with no tail belonging to Squirrel Nutkin, and a very much shrunk blue jacket belonging to Peter Rabbit, and a petticoat not marked that had gone lost in the washing, and at last the basket was empty. Then Mrs. Tingywinkle made tea, a cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. They sat before the fire on a bench and looked sideways at one another. Mrs. Tingywinkle's hand, holding the teacup, was very, very brown and very, very wrinkly with the soap suds. And all through her gown and her cap there was hairpins sticking wrong end out, so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. When they had finished tea, they tied up the clothes in bundles, and Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside her clean penny and fastened with a silver safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf and came out and locked the door and hid the key under the door sill. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tingywinkle with the bundles of clothes. 
all the way down the path little animals came out of the fern to meet them the very first that they met were peter rabbit and benjamin bunny and she gave them their nice clean clothes and all the little animals and birds were so very much obliged to dear mrs tinky winkle so that at the bottom of the hill when they came to the stile there was nothing left to carry except lucy's one little bundle lucy scrabbled up the stile with the bundle in her hand and then she turned to say good night and to thank the washerwoman but what a very odd thing mrs tinkywinkle had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bill she was running 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 up the hill and where was her white frilled cap and her shawl and her gown and her petticoat and how small she had grown and how brown and covered with prickles why mrs tinkywinkle was nothing but a hedgehog now some people say that little lucy had been asleep upon the stile but then how could she have found three clean pocket hankins and a penny pinned with a silver safety pin and besides i have seen that door into the back of the hill called cat bells and besides i am very well acquainted with dear mrs tinky winkle end of the tale of mrs tinky winkle by beatrix potter the weird witch of the willow herb by evelyn sharp this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the weird witch of the willow herb the weird witch of the willow herb lived in a pink cottage on the top of a hill she was merry and beautiful and wise and kind and she was all dressed in pink and green and she had great eyes that were sometimes filled with laughter and sometimes filled with tears and her round soft mouth looked as though it had done nothing but smile for hundreds and hundreds of years her pink cottage was the most charming place in the world to live in the walls were made of the flower of the willow herb and the roof was made of the green leaves and the floors were made of the white down and all the little lattice windows were cobwebs spun by the spiders who live in fairyland and make the windows for the fairy queen's own palace and no one but a wimp or a fairy could have said how long the weird witch of the willow herb had been living in her cottage on the top of the hill now any one might think that this wonderful witch was so sweet and so wise that all sorts of people would be coming all day long to ask her to help them for of course that is what a witch is for but this particular witch who lived in her pink cottage on the top of the hill had not been living there all that time for nothing if i did not keep a few spells lying about at the bottom of the hill i should never have a moment's peace chuckled the witch of the willow herb and that is why most of the people who came to ask her for spells never got so far as the pink cottage at all for they found what they wanted at the bottom of the hill and no doubt that saved everybody a great deal of trouble poor people said the weird witch with her voice full of kindness why should i make them climb up all this way just to see me sometimes however it did happen that somebody got to the top of the hill or else it is clear that this story would never have been written for one day as the witch sat on the doorstep of her pink cottage looking out over the world with her great eyes that saw everything the little princess winsome came running up the white path that twisted round and round and up and up until it reached the cottage at the top and she did not stop running until she stood in front of the weird witch herself she looked as though she must have come a long way in a great hurry for she had lost one of her shoes on the way and there was quite an important scratch on her dimpled chin but of course it is difficult to walk sedately when one is going to call on a witch i am princess winsome she announced as soon as she had breath enough to speak to be sure you are smiled the weird witch who knew that before and you have run away from home because because i want to find the bravest boy in the world interrupted the princess who never liked to let anybody else do the talking are they all cowards in your country then asked the witch oh no answered princess winsome the boys in my country are so brave that it is no fun playing with them they stop all the games by fighting about nothing at all and it's dreadfully dull when you're a girl isn't it perhaps it is smiled the witch then why are you looking for the bravest boy of all ah said the little princess wisely the bravest boy of all would never fight unless there was a reason you see and so we should have lots of time to play but how am i to find him the only way to find him is to let him find you said the weird witch 
and the best thing I can do for you is to shut you up in the middle of an enchanted forest, where no one but the bravest boy in the world would ever come to find anyone. Now make haste, or you won't get there in time. And the princess, with the scratch on her chin, must certainly have made haste, for she had quite disappeared by the time the witch's next visitor came up the winding white path, and that happened the very next minute. This time it was a boy who came along, a tall, strong, jolly-looking boy with his hands in his pockets and his cap at the back of his head, whistling a strange wild tune that was made up of all the songs of all the birds in the air, so that as he whistled it, every bird for miles round stopped to listen. I am Kit the Coward, he said, pulling off his cap to the witch. To be sure you are, smiled the weird witch, who knew that, too. And you have run away from home because the other boys called you a coward, and you want to show them that you are as brave as they are, only you won't fight without a reason. Isn't that it? Of course it is, answered Kit, who liked to have his talking done for him. But how shall I find something worth fighting about? That is not difficult, said the weird witch. All you have to do is go to the court of King Hurley Burley and ask him to give you something brave to do. The king is always going to war about something, so you will soon have as much fighting as you want. Now be off with you, or else someone else will get there before you. All right, said Kit, which is the way? Any way you like, laughed the weird witch. But in what direction? asked Kit. It doesn't matter, laughed the weird witch. So Kit made her another bow and marched away again down the hillside, whistling the same tune as before and all the birds of the air came flying along when they heard it, and they flew in front of him to show him the way, and he followed them over meadows and streams and orchards and cornfields until they brought him to the walls of King Hurley Burley's city, and they would not have left him then if he had not pointed out to them, most politely, that although it was very obliging of them to have come so far with him, he would find it a little inconvenient to travel any further with so many companions. So they flew away again, and Kit marched into the city and up to the gates of the king's palace. "'I have come to fight for the king,' said Kit, when the guards came out and asked him what he wanted, and he looked such a fine strong fellow that they took him in at once to the king. "'You have come in the very nick of time,' said King Hurley Burley, "'for the commander-in-chief of the royal forces has overslept himself so often that I had him beheaded this morning before he was awake. The army is in consequence without a head as well as the commander-in-chief, so if you will become their general and invade the country of my neighbor, King Topsy-Turvy, I shall be much obliged to you. Why have I got to invade the country of King Topsy-Turvy? demanded Kit. The king pushed his crown on one side, which he always did when he felt puzzled. Now you've come to mention it, he said. I believe there was a reason, but for the life of me I can't remember what it was. However, the reason is of no importance. Oh, yes, it is, interrupted Kit. I can't possibly fight without a reason, you know. Well, that's awkward, said King Hurley Burley. Perhaps the army will know. And he sent a message round to the barracks to ask the soldiers why they were going to war. But although the soldiers were all ready to begin fighting, they had not the least idea what the war was about. So the king's crown became more crooked than before. Won't it do if you invent a reason? He asked Kit for he could not help thinking how nice it would be to stay at home while his soldiers were being led to war by someone else. Oh, you may marry the Princess Winsome if you come back victorious, he added as an afterthought. But Kit only shook his head. He had never heard of the Princess Winsome, and he was not going to fight anybody without a very good reason for it. Then King Hurley Burley had a brilliant idea. We'll go and declare a war on the enemy to begin with, he said, and perhaps they will remember the reason. There was certainly no harm in declaring war, so Kit rode off at once on one of the king's fastest horses, and arrived the next morning at the court of King Topsy-Turvy, just as his majesty was sitting down to breakfast. "'I have come from King Hurley-Burley to declare war,' said Kit, who always went straight to the point. "'What for?' asked King Topsy-Turvy. "'I don't know,' said Kit. "'That's what I want you to tell me.' The king ate two eggs before he replied. "'Well,' he said presently, I believe I said that Hurley Burley was a shocking old muddler. I suppose that's it. All right, when do you want to begin? I don't want to begin at all, answered Kit. Why did you say he was a muddler? No, oh, just to make conversation, said King Topsy-Turvy, helping himself to marmalade. Then you don't really think he is an old muddler, asked Kit. Dear me, no, 
said King Topsy-Turvy. I never think. Then write that down on a piece of paper, and there needn't be a war at all, cried Kit. The king stroked his beard. Perhaps there needn't, he agreed, but I never write. I do, though, said Kit, who had learned to write while all the other boys were making catapults. You've only got to sign your name here. King Topsy-Turvy stopped eating his breakfast just long enough to sign the beautiful apology Kit had written on a sheet of notepaper. And then Kit jumped on his horse again and rode back to the palace of King Hurlyburly. Well, said His Majesty, did you discover the reason? There wasn't a reason, and there isn't going to be a war, answered Kit, and he held out the beautifully written apology from King Topsy-Turvy. What? cried His Majesty in alarm. Do you mean to say you stopped the war? Of course I have, said Kit, and I've come back victorious, as you see. Didn't you say something about a princess? But, stammered the king, how am I to appease the army? The army has set its heart on a war. So had I, answered Kit sadly, but I can never find anything worth fighting about. Meanwhile, where's the princess? You've not won the princess, said King Hurlyburly, who is now thoroughly cross. I believe you are a miserable coward. That is what the other boys say, answered Kit, smiling. It is not my fault that there is nothing to fight about. Will you please send for the princess? The princess has run away from home, so I can't send for her, said the king irritably. She is shut up in an enchanted forest and surrounded with wild beasts and magic spells and giants. It is not at all a nice place for a princess to be in, but how am I to get her away? Why, exclaimed Kit, laughing, here is something for your army to do. Let it go and rescue the princess. Nothing would induce the army to go near the place, explained the king sorrowfully. The army is too much afraid of being bewitched. Hurrah! shouted Kit, laughing more than ever. At last I have found something brave to do. I will go and rescue the princess. So Kit the coward started out on his travels once more, and no sooner did he get outside the city gates than he began to whistle his wonderful tune and down swept all the birds of the air in hundreds, and they flew in front of him as before, and led him to the very edge of the enchanted forest. There they left him, for no one can help anybody to go through an enchanted forest, and Kit knew fast enough that he must find the princess by himself. He was not a bit afraid, though, and he plunged straight into the wood without looking back. He had not taken two steps before he had completely lost himself. The trees were so thick overhead that not a streak of sunshine was able to get through, and the forest was so full of wild beasts that it was impossible to walk five yards without tumbling over a lion or a bear. But this did not frighten Kit at all, for he had learned to talk the language of the woods all the time that the other boys were knocking one another on the head, and so he soon made friends with every animal in the forest, and they told him the best places to find apples and nuts and blackberries and the bees brought him the very best honey they could make, and he grew so happy and so contented that he quite forgot he was enchanted and could not escape if he wanted to. But it is impossible to be happy for long when one is bewitched, and one day Kit found himself in a part of the forest that was more horrible and more frightening than any dark passage that was ever invented on the way to any nursery. It was not only dark, but it was strangely silent as well, and a curious feeling of gloom and unhappiness suddenly crept over Kit. If it had been a nice sort of silence, the sort we find when we get away from the other boys and girls into a place where it is quiet enough to hear the real sounds of the air, Kit would still have been quite happy. But here there was nothing to be heard at all, not even the brushing of the leaves, nor the blooming of the flowers, nor the growing of the grass. But the most frightening thing of all was when he clapped his hands together and stamped as hard as he could on the ground, for not a sound did he make, and when he tried to speak, he found he could only whisper, and when he burst out laughing, he made no more noise than if he had been smiling. Still, he kept his wits about him, for of course there was the princess to be rescued, and at last he thought of trying to whistle. At first he could not make a note sound in the stillness, but he went on trying until the wonderful tune he had learned long ago from the birds themselves began to echo once more through the silent forest. He did not get an answer at once, for really nice birds cannot be expected to go out of their way to a place where there is no sunshine, and the flowers cannot enter into conversation with them. But after a while a very fat blackbird, who certainly had impudence enough for anything, 
came hopping along from branch to branch until he landed on Kit's shoulder, and with him came sunshine and sound and merriment into the very heart of the melancholy forest, for none of these things are ever far off when a blackbird is near. Kit gave a shout of joy and hastened after the blackbird, who was hopping along the ground in front of him, and the next minute he found himself standing in a blaze of sunlight in front of a high stone wall. Beyond the wall he could see the tall towers of a great castle, but he did not trouble himself much about the other side of the wall, for on the top of it, with the sunshine pouring all over her, sat the most charming little girl he'd ever seen. She'd lost one of her shoes, and there was the faintest sign of a scratch on her round dimpled chin, and her long black hair flowed round her shoulders in a way that some people might have called untidy. But Kit was sure, directly he saw her, that she had come straight out of fairyland, and he was too amazed even to make her a bow. "'Dear me, what are you doing here?' asked the girl in a tone of great surprise. Kit took a step nearer the wall and pulled off his cap. Her voice reminded him that, although she belonged to fairyland, she was still a little girl and would expect him to remember his manners. "'I've come to rescue the princess,' he said. "'Can you tell me where she is?' "'She lives in the castle over there,' answered the girl. "'What are you going to do when you have rescued her?' "'Well, I suppose I shall ask her to marry me,' said Kit. "'Do you think she will?' "'Ah,' she replied gravely, "'that depends on whether you have my permission. "'Tell me who you are to begin with.' "'I'm Kit the Coward,' he said simply, "'and he stared when she broke into the merriest peal of laughter imaginable. "'What nonsense!' she cried. If you were a coward, you would never have got here at all. Is that true? asked Kit eagerly. Then do you think the princess will marry me? The girl looked down at him for a moment with her untidy little head on one side. Then she bent and held out her two hands to him. I think, perhaps, the princess will, she said softly. If you will help me down from this enormous high wall, we will go and ask her. So Kit lifted her down from the wall, which was quite an easy matter for it was in reality no higher than he was, and the little girl was certainly the lightest weight he had ever held in his arms. "'What are you looking for?' he asked when he had set her on the ground, for she was kneeling down and turning over the dry leaves in a most distressed manner. "'I'm looking for my crown, of course,' she said with a pout. "'It tumbled off my head just before you came, and I was too frightened to jump all that long way to find it.' Oh, "'Here it is,' said Kit, and he picked up the little glittering crown and set it gently on the top of her beautiful rumpled hair. Then he started back in surprise. "'You are the princess,' he shouted. "'Of course I am,' laughed Princess Winsome, putting her hand in his. "'I knew that all the time. Shall we go home now?' Kit did not reply immediately, for no one can do two things at once, and it took him quite a long time to kiss the small soft hand that lay in his own big one. And as for going home, when they did start, they did not get very far, for it must not be forgotten that they were still in an enchanted forest, and it is easier to get into an enchanted forest than to get out of it again. However, as they had everything in the world to talk about, they would probably have been most annoyed if they had found their way instead of losing it. So they just went on losing it as happily as possible until they could not walk another step, because an immense giant was occupying the whole of the roadway. There he sat, smoking a great pipe that looked like a chimney pot that wanted sweeping. And when the princess saw him, she was so frightened that she hid herself behind Kit and peeped under his arm to see what was going to happen. Hello, said the giant in a huge voice that made the grass stand on end with fright, just as it does after a hoarfrost. What's this? You're running away with the princess. To be sure I am, said Kit, and if you don't let me pass, I shall have to kill you. Oh, dear, sighed the giant, raising a wind that made the trees shiver for miles around. They all say that, and there's no peace for a poor giant nowadays. When I was a boy, the prince was always put under a spell as well as the princess. However, I suppose I must make an end of you if you are determined to fight and he laid down his pipe and rose most unwillingly to his feet. Kit laughed out loud with gladness, for at last he had found a good reason for a fight, and no one would be able to call him a coward any more. But before there was time to strike a single blow, the giant gave a loud howl of alarm, 
took to his heels, and in another moment was completely out of sight. Kit turned in amazement to his little princess, and then he saw what had frightened the giant, for all the animals of the forest, all the lions and the tigers and the bears and the wolves, stood there in rows waiting to help him. So there is no doubt that the giant would have been killed by somebody if he had not run away. Isn't it wonderful, said the little princess in a whisper. But Kit covered his face with his hands. It's no use, he said in a disappointed tone. The other boys will never believe that I am not a coward. Princess Winsome came and pulled his hands away and laughed softly. I think you are the bravest boy in the world, she said. Of course he is, chuckled a voice somewhere near. How stupid some people are, to be sure. And there sat the weird witch under a tree, all in her pink and green gown, with her great eyes brim full of fun and nonsense. And as the boy and girl stood hand in hand before her, and caught the glance of her beautiful witch's eyes, all sorts of muddles fell out of their heads, and they began to understand everything that had been puzzling them for years and years and years. That only shows what a witch can do when she is the right sort of witch. Dear little princess, cried Kit, it doesn't matter whether the other boys believe me or not, so long as you know I'm not a coward. Besides, added Princess Winsome, we are not going to try to make anybody believe anything. I think we'll stay here instead, forever and ever and always. Very good idea, smiled the weird witch of the willow herb, as she nodded at them both. Always remain enchanted if you can. So they had the nicest and funniest wedding possible on the spot, and there was no time wasted in sending out invitations, for all the guests were already waiting there in rows, with the exception of the singing birds, and Kit very soon summoned them by whistling a few notes of his wonderful tune. The princess laid her own wedding breakfast under the trees, and the wedding guests helped her by bringing her everything that was nice to eat in the forest, such as roasted chestnuts and preserved fruits and truffles and barley sugar cane, and lots of dew drops and honey drops and pear drops. And the weird witch completed the feast by turning a piece of rock that nobody wanted into a wedding cake. And everyone will agree that it is better for a rock to turn into a wedding cake than for a wedding cake to turn into a rock. And all the flowers came of their own accord and arranged themselves on the table, which they certainly did much more prettily than anybody else could have done it for them. And when the wedding was over, they just walked away again, instead of stopping until they were dead, which, of course, is what they would have done at any other wedding. And although the bride had lost her other shoe by the time she was ready to be married, and although her beautiful hair was more untidy than ever, and her crown had tumbled off again and had to be brought to her by an obliging lion, Kit never noticed any of these things, and only felt quite certain that he was marrying somebody who had come right out of fairyland and was not an ordinary princess at all. No doubt it was because he was in an enchanted forest that he made such a mistake, and no doubt it is because he has never been disenchanted since that he is making the same mistake to this day. As for the weird witch of the willow herb, she went back to her pink cottage on the top of the hill, so as to be ready to make the next person happy who came up the white winding path. But before she went, she took care that all the singing birds should fly back to Kit's home and tell the other boys how brave he had been, which they did with the greatest pleasure imaginable. It is said that the story became slightly exaggerated, but when we know how much one little bird can tell, it is not difficult to imagine the kind of story that could be told by hundreds and hundreds of little birds. End of The Weird Witch of the Willow Herb by Evelyn Sharp Read by Colleen McMahon